This week on the True Jody Podcast. The biggest selling male artist in British music history. And his name is Robbie Williams. I've spent the whole summer with you guys. Mm. Literally on tour. Every podcast that's come out, I've mm. watched beginning to end. I'm a huge fan. <laughs> <laughs> something to tell you and she said I've got something to tell you and I'm like well you first and she said you're in that band you can find yourself going down a rabbit oh, hole completely and it's a lot of fun but if you mix that with marijuana <laughs> <laughs> my ism whatever I've got that drove me to be the person I am is an unrelenting monster that doesn't know when enough's enough Let's just say my life became in danger. Right. And uh, it wasn't safe for me to be... I mean, I'd love to say. I'd, I'd love to say. Why can't, I can't you? No, I can't. I it, don't know. I don't know. How are man? I don't know. No one's going to get you in here. Mm. Oh, well, I used to sleep with a, um, a gun. Let's put it that way. Right. And What a, was that gun's name? <laughs> it was called Desi Eagle. Right. <laughs> I have an ism... Uh, an alcoholism, an addiction, but also my own special ism that makes me want to isolate, that makes me want to keep away from people. You know, it's like I, I don't want to be him. Why not? Uh, what I don't want to, I don't want to be the hermetic yeah. isolator. Yeah. Uh, because I like people. And it's like if I get miffed or if I get upset or if I feel as though you're putting me down, I just I want to kill you. And whereas before, I was trying anything because I was experimenting, all of a sudden you sort of like, I've got to find a hit from somewhere. And I never thought like that. Your song of your career um, comes Angels. Massive, massive song, the biggest song. Someone claimed he wrote that. Yes, mate. Hi, right, man. If you didn't want to come, you could have just said. I was going there. Nice to meet you, too. All right. Bye-bye. How's it going, lads? Happy birthday, Twat! How's it going? You alright? Feeling good? Yeah, feeling alright. Hi, it's, it's, been a great it's a bit of a downgrade from what we used to, isn't it? But we'll make it work. Yeah, the Alfie Days one was a good one. Yeah, did you enjoy that? Man? Yeah, what, um, where are you on Alfie Days these days? Um, I think he's a nice guy. Yeah. I do, I, I genuinely rate him as a nice guy. Um, Shit. Food. Food. food? Yeah, food is actually First thing. It said on Google reviews the food was good. Um, you got to think of the cash cow though, do you know what I mean? Who buys the tickets? Think about that. Everyone who apparently. Who does buy the tickets? By well, by everyone, the yeah, good point. Yeah. I've been watching the Men vlogs. Menopausal people now, yeah. for me. Even yeah. the men. <laughs> Are we in? Are we going? Technically, right, yeah. we're going. Okay. Yeah. Men so menopausal women, love them. Yeah. Officially. Yeah. Love them. We're already onto it. Mums with the menopause. Apparently you get some cream that really helps with um, those women if you want to have um, it's, sex. It's my favourite category uh, on you porn. Yeah. Menopausal mums <laughs> yeah. with cream. So, yeah. 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 Mm. Um, it's a good place to start. Mental. Mental. That's... So, actually, this is a weird Actually, one. it's big black dicks. We That's, that is my favourite. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Ba BBCs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. BBCs. BBDs. Yeah. Do you know, if you, if you want to watch porn, you don't want to watch something where it's sort of half job. Do you know what I mean? You want to see the, the back doors being broken in, don't you, Robbie? Yeah, you sort of you get straight into the fake taxi. Mm -hmm. Do you know the fake taxi? Oh, you know, what's that? Oh, well, wow. we're hoping to get him on after you. Yeah. Do you know you what paid I mean? the license Keep fee, working though, so. way up. Keep going up in the world. Yeah. Fake taxi. I wonder if he's got a nice house like this. Uh, I, think he, I think he's too. doing really, really well. I mean, there's lots of content. There's, he's a content king. <laughs> mm -hmm. anyway. be fair, on, on YouTube right now, there's a bit of an issue of people ripping stuff off, whereas he's found that niche and he's, he's nailed it down. In a way, Fake yeah. Taxi. Quite literally nailed um, it down. I this think this is a bit too, too normal, isn't it? Um, I think me and Robbie feel a bit more normal than you, judging by your face. It's your birthday today. Well, I haven't said It's that. my birthday today. Thank Happy you very much. Happy birthday. Yeah, yeah. Hurtling yeah. towards 30, mate. How are you feeling? Right. We spoke about this. Yeah, how, how old are you? I'm 30. Yeah. Okay. Just turned. So when you were 29, how did you feel? Same, really. Same. Yeah. And when you were 30, didn't I, actually, care? I feel better because I'm richer than when I was 29. Sorry, can so I just that's... give you two both a second? Because I can tell you want to look at each other and work out what the other one looks like in real life because you've been going back and forth. <laughs> Hi, Brian. I can, Handsome yeah. mustard. Uh, I can oh, see you two thanks, taking mate. each other's face in. You're both going... Yeah, oh. no, no, we, 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 had a, we, we had a chat because you were late coming down today. Yeah. 
So we we did the podcast Kept before the podcast. We, we're quite. I, I I feel as though we've we've got had repartee between each other. It's a good we, hug. Yeah, it was a good yeah. hug, and, and we're now fine with each other. You haven't had the chance but to we, do that. Well, the thing is, what a lot of people won't know because they're like, "How the fuck's Jordy got Robbie Williams on the podcast?" I'm on a train in about August September time, and I get an email off uh, one of the people who work with you saying, "My client would like to talk to you." I'm like, oh, "Fuck, another time waster." That's all I need. Um, tell them, tell them that uh, messages on Facebook. That's tell it. Joe Sog to message me on Facebook. <laughs> right. Uh, she's like, no, um, he doesn't use Facebook. I was like, who the fuck doesn't use Facebook? What kind of loser? She's like, oh, it's Robbie Williams. Oh, all right then. He has no, no, no. To be fair, your original reaction was probably isn't really. No, Robbie I, I did. I did think it was absolute bollocks, mate. To be honest, did with I you. send a picture or something? Um, I think you sent. Uh, no, I said follow us on Twitter if it's oh, really yeah, you because yeah, yeah. you're talking shit. Always yeah. thinking business. Um, Always thinking business. Looks yeah, good. Yeah, well, the, the mad thing you. is, mm. is that I've spent the whole summer with you guys, mm. literally on tour. Uh, it, every podcast that's come out, I've mm. watched beginning to end. I'm a huge fan, so it, it's it's like <laughs> it's, a new yeah, it's, a mu- it's just like a mutual yeah. weirdness because, like you know, the televisions, well, the computer screens come to life. Mm. Yeah. So and obviously, you know, I've sold a few records, so you know me. So mm. there's a, like a, a mutual <laughs> that, best-selling the, the UK artist around the world. Say just this. saying, R- like. Lawrence wanted to be you, especially when he was younger. Eight, like when you were eight. Yeah, like, when you were younger, you really wanted. To, so this is a bit. I told Robbie earlier the first mm. single I bought was Rock DJ, yeah. and I uh, played that. Even on had the repeat. pants, did you? Uh, shall I tell? Isn't it quite an embarrassing story? Yeah, yes. we want to hear that. Yeah, I was a bit of a showy kid. You, really? Yeah, only child, obviously. Yeah. Um, and when Rock DJ came out, obviously you stripped down in the video. Yeah. So I gathered my family in the living room and went, I'm going to perform Robbie Williams, Rock DJ. <laughs> Little did they, they know I was going to strip down to my pants. Because of the video, Because of the video, mm-hmm. yeah. So where did you channel your uh, showiness then? Where did, because... Just celebrities that I looked up to at the time. Yeah, no, but when you, you, you were you going to be like, were you jazz handsy? Were you going no. to be an actor or a singer or... Actor. An actor. Kids, I want to be an actor. Mm. Yeah. And what happened? You see how he's flipping it. Um, he's the interviewer now. Yeah. We've got a long time. So we do. I, yeah, I, I've, got, I've got questions too. Great, mate. Yeah, uh, go on. So what um, happened? I was on the stage as a kid. <coughs> I was on, I, not like in London, but in Burton. In <laughs> Burton. I was huge in Burton. I did the I was, town hall. Listen, um, I, uh, the Amateur Operatic Society in Stoke-on-Trent has yeah. never had a finer actor yeah. than me since I left. There you go, yeah. So well, I understand. I've seen the videos of him doing... Um, Oliver yeah. Twist. That's it. I oh, jeez! You've been doing your you've been doing your research. Mate, I, I, I basically spent that twenty four hours watching Robbie Williams documentaries. Oh wow! Yeah. The problem oh, is, wow, mm. wow! I've seen a lot. Loose yeah. women, a hell of a lot. Loose women interviews, very insightful. Let me go. Just go back. So, Sorry. so you're at school. Yeah. You're a showy kid. You're very. in Burton. Mm. Are you doing local amateur operatic Obviously. society yeah. stuff? And Lee School of Speech and Drama. It's still there. Oh wow! <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Sake. What Lovely is woman. that? Is that why your Scouse accent is rounded off? No, no. I th- I don't know if I mentioned this on the podcast before, but my dad was a teacher in the school. And yeah, so mentioned he, it a few times. Yeah. And he used to get uh, kids from the school to come and uh, like babysit me. Right. And one night when we first moved down, these two girls came over um, and babysat me. And as I was reading them the book that I had set as homework from school, they were laughing and they were like, why do you talk like that? And I was like, I'm just the way I talk. And they're like, oh, it should be a bit, 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 bit. And then I uh, cut that out from there on because I was so embarrassed about it. The scouse bit or the talking like a baby? The scouse bit. <laughs> oh, right. The scouse bit. The baby bit I, I retained. So you're at school. You're doing a me on me. You, yeah. you're, doing, you're at school. You're doing local amateur operatic stuff. You're yeah. going to Lee, Lee? Lee and Lee School of Speech. Okay. Yeah. And so that's, that's what you're going to do. Why did you let your dreams die? I found radio. Oh, okay. Yeah. Hospital radio. No, well, no, I listened to Heart FM at the time. You were huge on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, they love that because they can rinse, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I used to record the songs off the radio and then play them back to my mum and be like, here's a song for you, mum. Here's a song for, you know. So you whoever. did your own radio show in your I, own house? I used to record the adverts off the radio and then I had to, I'd done like a take to take deck. So, so then you went into proper radio? Yeah. And what was that? Hospital, uh, hospital radio. Where at? Burton. Phoenix. Okay. Phoenix Hospital Radio. And we you... Phoenix rises from the flames. Right, okay. Yeah. Poorly people get well. Yeah. Is that what it is? Exactly, yeah. That should be the emblem. <laughs> Poorly people get well. And originally, that was the hashtag. I've told this story on the podcast before, but originally they tried to get rid of us because they didn't really like us because we were okay. too young and boisterous. And you did the talking? Uh, yeah. 
Did you ever get into trouble? Was there anything that you ever said that was sort of near the knuckle? We upset a few people in the first few weeks and then they tried to get rid of us and then I came back. And uh, they didn't like when we played the game where we guessed what the job of the person was based on their car. Oh, really? <laughs> so that, someone that, was walking... That the, upset them, annoyed them? The nurses got upset. Okay. Because so you were at hospital radio. It is the start of the podcast. I'm asking the questions for a little bit. Is that okay? Bit, oh, do, me, do whatever Brian's the fuck you want. Okay. Brian's got a life as well. So uh, you anyway. then went from hospital radio to where? Sheffield, where I did community radio. Okay. Trained Did people. you start getting paid there? They paid for my travel. Did they pay you at the hospital? No, no. <coughs> uh, we used to just get a lift from my dad and then my friend got a car and then when he got a car he was, became really cool and then I went to the hospital radio alone. Uh, he was a lovely guy, Daniel. So you travelled up from Burton to Sheffield? On a daily basis. On a daily basis. A Derbyshire Wayfair, a Yorkshire Wayfair and it was like eight quid and you could just go there and back every day. It was lovely. So then you went from there to where? London. And then the Doctor rest of the big history. city. That was his big dream. The big and city. the big dream was always to go to London. Yeah. Because I didn't get I didn't get to go to Manchester and then What did you think of London when you got there? Oh, it was the best place in the world, isn't it? Yeah, well, yeah. Oh, the streets are paved with paved with gold. But you know so you know this. Do you really do you really like do you really love London? When I first came to London, I'd wake up every day and be like, I cannot believe I'm in London. Did you right. not have that feeling when you first when did you first come down? You must have come down quite young as well. I came down when I was Well, we were always down I auditioned for Take That when I was fifteen. Yeah. Got in when I was sixteen travel the country trying to apply our wares and sell ourselves to you know gay clubs at the start yeah, we did that. we did gay clubs for I've like seen, 18 I've months I've seen a lot of that in the uh, documentary I watched uh, about Take That we right. did a lot of gay clubs the, on the hospital radio the first music video so I'm watching on the on the train on the way down and the first music video you made you were like covered in jelly on your bums and that yeah so, like, have you seen it Yes. So there's five guys on, on, on the screen here covered in jelly on their asses and mm. like the person next to us is like and I'm like just, uh, just do a bit. Of re- I've got. A, I've got an interview with Robbie Williams. Well, I, we, yeah, well, I'm not I, actually. I have got a copy. This. I have got a copy of my book for you both. Oh, and, but I also have bought a uh, couple of copies of Loaded magazines, which you can hide the wow. book in for the train back that's up perfect. to Newcastle that's brilliant. or wherever you're going. Can I get to you just? Can I get you to sign that? Do you mean this book, yeah. Robbie? That's Your new book, book, Reveal. Reveal. Oh, this, this, yeah. is that, this is the one. Well, that one. This, that one. Yeah, that this one. book here. What reasonably priced it? Say the RLP, but it's very reasonably priced, and it's a hard, co- it's a hard, hard cover. Do you get asked what you think it should be charged at? No, oh, no, no, not at all. There's a bit of debate about that. The the, the the gay clubs and the video for "Do What You Like." I would uh, ask you all to. What was the pause? All the latex and all of that, and like all of the it's the look, the, wasn't it? Well, at the time, no, but why? Why were you? Were you dressed like that? Was there a reason? I don't know if you can guess the sexual preference of our manager. At the well, time. that's the thing. When I watched him, it sort of really all made sense. I was like, he's had a big influence on this um, on this group of lads. Yeah. Um, Why don't you all dress up and put um, jelly on your asses? That doesn't sound like a very public. Oh, believe me, we'll love it. Yeah. I mean, I, you, I, okay. Can we talk pa- about pause, him? Pause the podcast. Yeah, yeah. we can. Uh, he, he's a very litigious man. What does litigious mean? That he, means he's going to come after us if, if we say anything if bad. If we say anything bad about him, we can talk so about him. So if I say I thought he'd come across as a bit of a cunt a in, the, uh, in the interview, he'd probably come after us. They, well. Listen, those are your words, not I'm mine. I'm a Z-lister, so and there's also, no point me. he isn't a cunt. He sounds like a lovely No, you come across as a cunt. So, well, yeah. Anyway, so he... Put up five grand to record that video. Do what you like. Go and watch the uh, the, 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 the version. Go watch the version <laughs> that's the unedited version. <laughs> See our asses right now. Yeah. This is the most probably the most embarrassing video I you've ever seen. I would say uh, it's way worse than anything. Take that up. Uh, the one where you sit sorry, in the bath is pretty uh, embarrassing as well. And uh, like Backstreet Boys, none of them went that far. Yeah. You know Have you mean? ever seen Jason Statham dancing in a Shaman video? <laughs> no. Have but, you ever seen that? No. I think is it on a level? Is it? Well, well, I think Take That blows the door off wow. that. But Jason okay. Statham's dancing in the video for the Shaman. I think it was is is in a similar ballpark. Yeah. Anyway, so we did this video. We we're in latex. And I'm 16 in that video. Whoa. I'm legal. 16. I'm, I've actually I'm just watched it. Completely legal. legal though, not, in the, not in the gay community boys. at that time. Not so. in the gay community, no, but I'm completely legal, so there's nothing wrong with that. Oh, yeah. right. And uh, we're in latex, and there's jelly, and a girl touches me, yeah. which I was very excited about because she was a model and she was gorgeous. Was that your first model, was it? Yeah, it was the first model that touched, touched me. Yes, it was the first what, model. One of many, as we're going to say. Well, out, well yeah. you know, I, I did all right. 
right. Uh, but um, so the video, the video is probably the most uh, embarrassing video that, that ever is in well, the history of music. In the gay clubs as well, though, you're in the clubs and you're sort of doing all of the sort of gyrating and that, and there's a lot of leather. Uh, flying around. Do you know what, what was that like being surrounded by men, sort of at bated breath? Okay. Well, first of all, after we recorded that video, Nigel Martin Smith charged us ten pounds to receive a copy of that video. Of course. Of course. Yeah. Nothing wrong with that. No. Was that I, your manager? That? Yeah, absolutely nothing wrong with Why that. Why was he charging you? We, 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 you know, he just wanted to charge you know, fifty quid to be made, wasn't there? So, Postage and packaging, isn't it? Yeah, he so, had your best interest at heart. He, of course clearly, he did. Of course clearly. he did. So um, he charged us ten quid each for a copy of that video. Of course, it was a video that I couldn't take back to Stoke on Trent and play to anybody. Yeah, which you will understand if you've now seen the video. That is that not was that not going against who you were a little bit because I know you wanted to succeed, but you come across as like a bit of a normal lad in terms of like you're like football you're, you're no 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 it was, it was Willy Wonka's Chocolate Factory Willy, Wonk. Willy Wonka's yeah. which is weird because when I went into your bathroom that's what I sort of thought of. right well I stuck know, with you which, 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 Nigel which? had the golden ticket mm. and right. you know it, it was like first off the question was what was it like being in gay clubs and what um, was that like absolutely incredible right uh, because you're from Newcastle <sighs> <laughs> Burton by Liverpool and I always used to think that um, I had a built in uh, uh, detector for danger right. because I always used to manage to get myself out of scrapes until I didn't when I got in, when I was 17 I got some notoriety then the scrapes became impossible to get out of but I always used to think that oh I, 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 this is like something protecting me but the fact is you know, when you grow up where we grow up, there's lots of lovely people, but also there's lots of people whose special talent is being psychos. That is, that's such a, and, yeah. and, you know, it's, it's not that you've got an inbuilt ability to detect danger. It's that you're always looking for it. Yeah. Which is what happened to me when I was, you know, because I was a latchkey kid. You sort of go out and you're miles away from your house and you're nine years old and you're mm -hmm. 10 years old. You kind of have to adapt really quickly and learn how to protect yourself by making yourself invisible and small because mm. there's a lot of psychos, a lot of lovely people too. Mm. Anyway, Welcome to so I was drinking from an early age and I'd be going to clubs and pubs and I, I had these uh, metal toe cap boots and I used to grade where I was going to that evening with which boots or trainers I put on. And it was like, if it's a dodgy place that I'm going to, I'm going to put on these metal toe cap boots because it might kick off. But if I felt safe there, I'll put on Have you ever had metal trainers. toe cap boots on? What do you think? Probably not. You know those like Australian workmen boots? No, those? no. I, I, I've lived in them pretty much oh, okay. before YouTube. Mm. I tell you what, if you've got to kick off one of them, you yeah. fucking know well, the, well, there you go. Exactly. So, so I was, you sort of, in. You, you, you learn the language of the streets. I don't want to put it in that way. You, you mm. learn to adapt, make yourself That's small. what we're going to call the podcast. <laughs> the language, the of, language the of the streets. Robbie Williams. <laughs> <laughs> the Robbie Williams and, story. And then, and then brackets, grime artist. <laughs> yeah, good. Yeah. So anyway, brackets all of a sudden, mm. I found myself in gay clubs right. and you didn't have to worry about steel toe cap boots anymore. You know, you were just... It, Is there no fights in that in gay clubs? No. No, no I'm, I'm sure there'd be like bitch fights or whatever. Mm. But it was just... A different kind of danger now. Well, well, not 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 really. You know, it's like I, nothing ever happened to me. You know, it was just like hedonistic, yeah. and you were safe. And there was, you know, the music was glorious, the energy was incredible, and I loved being there. You know, so that I, I'm 16, I've just left Take That. We're doing uh, gigs in gay clubs, and you know, you you have the preconceptions about going to well, everybody will try to fuck us or feel us up or anything. Does nothing like that yeah. happened. But the first right. night I was in one of the gay clubs, a place called La Cage. I was in a dressing room, sixteen, fresh out of Stoke, and there's a guy in the corner having a wank, and I'm like, this is uh, we've all done it. This is we've all done it. Mm. This is really uncomfortable. I've heard about these places, and look, it's happening in front of me, and. He had his back turned to, to me. And then I find out he's the stripper and he was just pumping his penis up. Right. But that was the, that was my introduction. So as, as dangerous as it ever got yeah, towards, yeah yeah, 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 pleased to meet you. Yeah. We're, as dangerous as it ever got, that was it. People do um, 
think of gay clubs as quite predatory, though, don't they? Which is <laughs> do they? I don't know. I know a lot of people who think. I know. I thought well, it's a good night out. To be fair, though. I think it's changed maybe the perception down the years, but especially back then, not that long ago, but back then it was like gay clubs. You know, that was almost like it was like a there was like queer as folk was around at that time. That sort of thing. There was this that kind of before vibe. queer as really queer as folk. But it was so. that, similar to that scene. Uh, I don't know. I didn't watch Queer as Folk. Nor did I. But what I got from it, it was like, it, it was an amazing night out. If I was going to go to any club right now, I'd go to a gay night in an in instant. Because, you know. When did, so all this sort of kicked off really quickly when you were very young. You've joined Take That. This is this band. You don't know if it's going to work. It might work. It might not. And you've got this manager there who seemed, he, he reminded me like a lot of these managers who have these young boy bands. He reminded me a little bit of the guy who had NSYNC and the Backstreet Boys. Um, in a sort NWA. of, a, I, I mean, you say he's the type to come after you, but he just seemed a bit wrong. Like there's something I didn't trust. He didn't seem like an honest person in his interviews. He he didn't seem like he loved and cared about you guys. He was like, well, you should be fucking grateful. That was the idea from a lot of what he said. Because you said, you know, I wanted you to love us. I wanted you to value us. You're like a member of a team. You want the manager of the, of the football team to really believe in you and, and care about you. And for, it was just you were a lad who was given a job to do. Yeah, I, 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 which instantly you sort of that was the thing that I was instantly thrown into my first uh, experience of the adult world because I, I thought we were going to join a gang. And you know, so we're going to be in this gang together. We're going to conquer the world. There's going to be loads of fun. Take that! Yeah. Yeah. And that's not how it was because you know, sort of join a band. And I, I, I think that Nigel had, had heard Gary Barlow's demo tape yeah. and really liked them. Then met Gaz, decided to put a band around him. I didn't know all of this at the time, but I subsequently do now. So. Gaz, in his own right, is he was sort of like making more money than his teachers were <coughs> when he was thirteen. Yeah, you know he'd had a a big talent for the piano, keyboard, and was going out into the clubs and making his own money. So he, you know, he he was confident in his own ability. And then all of a sudden, he was a manager saying, "We're going to put these four boys behind you," and I don't think he really wanted four boys behind him. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and then you throw Nigel into the mix where I think he just saw me as a problem from day one and he, he wanted to kind of control everything. And um, even down to coriander and curries. He'd be like, uh, five chicken, tikka masala, no coriander for the boys. So it'd be even down to the nth degree with the curries. Why didn't and he like coriander, just to be clear? I don't know, but I never got to taste coriander and take that. Coriander's great. And I hate you for that, Nigel, because yeah. I, I like coriander. It's really good Anyway, style. I don't know yeah. what the man's like now. I don't know who he is now. But at the time, it was very difficult for me to enjoy myself because uh, I just felt as though... Um, it, he's very litigious, so I've got to pick my words very carefully. You know, I just... He wasn't pleasant towards me can I get sued for that no being pleasant you didn't feel me? like he was pleasant to, you didn't no. feel there was a pleasant so, relationship uh, there just to so I understand this a bit better and also Gary's written about this in his book <clears throat> right but him and Nigel went to Disneyland mm -hmm. right together alone alone right did, did you feel a bit left out really did because I really wanted to go Gary to Disneyland. was the favourite then yeah Gary was Gary was the favourite and, and, and hence was the start of the problem mm -hmm. that uh, I had with Gaz, you know, was so, sort of, but we'll get onto that at a later date. Well, yeah, yeah. We could just do whatever, you know what I mean? Yep. Easy. It, it feels a little bit like there's so, but you are quite a dis, you, people always paint you as quite a disruptive character. Do you know what I mean? That's what they paint you as. Do you think you are, we're actually that as a, a figure? Um, I think that if people tell you something enough times, yeah. then you become that. At that point in time, the rave scene, was happening, which a lot of your guests seem so to funny, talk about. And also, you know, it's like I was in a lily white pop group. Yeah. But that, that, really doesn't, mean, that doesn't mean that I was going home listening to the Osmonds. Oh. You know, that's not who I was, you know. So what I were was, you listening to? I, uh, NWA, Public Enemy, uh, House Music, Acid House. Uh, and, you know, I'd sort of, some, I'd done Acid and Speed and Ecstasy 
or by the time that I was 16. So um, yes, as a public figure, I was uh, singing, uh, you know, could it be magic now? But I was still got it. Still you know, holds still it. Still holds a note. Yeah. Uh, uh, I I was, Even better alive in concert. I was, you know, this, and there was no social media either. Mm. So I was getting away with an awful lot of stuff that you simply couldn't get away with uh, for for people that are in the same position that I was back in the day. So I was in this lily white band, but also I was a bit of a nutter, mm. you know. It I, reminded me when I'm watching this, this back behind the scenes videos of you, of the behind the scenes videos of Gaza. You know, the England team, everyone's sort of trying to be, you know, Heads down, Sensor, focus, and then you've yeah. got Gaza. How's that? Now, the door is wrong. The take that, that that boys were a little bit wild, but you were just a little bit more than them. I think you you were a bit more of a wild lad than what they were. Yeah, but it wasn't like they were innocent. But um, it just felt like you didn't belong there. Like even when I look back at it, that they all sort of looked like a boy band, and then there's you on the end, skinhead, fucking, just screaming, fucking. Look. Yeah, the, yeah, I. I there was, uh, it wasn't... Were you the black sheep? I was the black sheep and it wasn't sort of set up. It was a sort of divide and conquer mentality. So, you know, it's like I, I wanted, I, like I said before, I wanted us all to be in a gang and I always wanted us to all love each other and, you know, common purpose and going forward together. But there was divisions mm. and, um, you know, back home weird stuff was happening too when you become what famous... You well, you know, I was telling a story to Al. Elliot, young Al. Elliot, our oh, resident Stoke lad. Yeah, resident Stoke lad, uh, big up the long term massive. Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> so you become famous, you get a bit of notoriety, and you think it's going to be everything, and you kind of psychologically think, although you, w I wouldn't have been able to tell you as a sixteen year old, this is going to fill in all the blanks, everything that I'm missing as a person, everything that isn't in my personality everything that I'm uncomfortable about is going to be all sorted out when I become famous and I sell records or I become an actor because yeah. I wanted to become and an actor. And you get money. Huh? And you get money as well. And you get money too, which I didn't think about really very much. Was it, was it for the money? first? No, for the first 18 months, I think we made about £190. Right. Fuck. For the first 18 months. How was that the case? Because they will have not been making £190 off you. Well, you're kind of nobodies. So you're kind right. of doing, you know, like you have to do when you're starting out in any business, you're doing favours for people, you're turning up and you're... You, it wasn't like X Factor now where people win a competition and they're superstars. No. You had to, like, grind to get up the charts, the old Farm mitzvahs, way. weddings. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And you sort of, you paid for your petrol, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, that's the front door. Sorry, right, guys. Sorry. Um, so... Yeah, so for the f I was living off the bank of mum. Mm -hmm. Nobody was ripping us off. I don't want to suggest that. It's just that there wasn't any money being made because there wasn't any money to be made. And what happened with us, we'd sort of like, we'd get up in the morning and do a school assembly. And then we'd do another school in the afternoon. And then we'd go to a under 18s nightclub, a youth club, an over 18s nightclub, and three gay clubs. And it'd be all in one day. That wow. we'd be doing this and we'd be in our yellow you must Salford. Be fucking exhausted, were you? Well, we were young enough to do it, though. Yeah. You know, we, we were full of energy, full of beans. This was the golden ticket. This is the way out. And yeah, it was, it was knackering, but that was not the thing that I had a problem with at the time. And we used to have these cards, and uh, these cards had a picture of us for like a promo cover of Do What You Like, mm -hmm. the legendary video that's online. And uh, on the back, it would be our fan club address. And these girls would write into us. And we went the length and breadth of the country and handed out these cards. And we managed to amass 75,000 addresses, which is what I think. I mean, the power of A Million Love Songs, one of Gary's songs, is a big tune. But I think the big thing that got assigned was that we had 75,000. It was data. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, it was data. So there was actually a concrete thing. And nobody wanted to sign us at the time because boy bands weren't the rigueur anymore. They'd gone out of fashion. And um, I think it was BMG uh, decided to take a, a gamble on us and they signed us. But it was through graft, determination, hard work and nothing else existing back at home because I'd just left school and I'm dyslexic. I can't retain information. I, I spent 
five years at my high school sort of acting the part of somebody that's listening and taking information in but I I don't know if it's the same when you were at school was a lots of coursework it was oh, it, yeah a fair bit yeah did you do it uh, I did the coursework I, but I, I only in subjects that I thought oh, I could I mean like stuff that I'm interested in a bit like English and so I quite like reading uh, stories and stuff but other than that so you pissed that you were good at that I was good at English that was the one thing I was good at uh, did you get an A did I well, I got nothing higher than a D. At all. Yeah. Any At subject. all. In any subject. Yeah, it, it, a- academia just wasn't and isn't for me. And also, at the same time, you didn't have uh, dyslexia. That wasn't, that wasn't a thing you, think, you were just... Why do you just couldn't spell. Just Basically. couldn't spell. Yeah. Why do you think it is that so many really successful people come from no exam results and stuff like that? Because the amount of people I talk to who are like ultimate success stories and yet they've done terrible at school well I I think you know they say that if you're I'm not going to liken it to this but if you're blind your other senses pop up Mm -hmm. maybe I mean I I don't know if that's been proven true so I'm sure the internet will shout at me and tell me whether that's right or not but I think it might be like that it's like oh okay I'm ridiculously bad at all of these things that I'm supposed to be good at that's Mm -hmm. actually forming my life and that's terrifying. If well, if I can't do this, then I'm going to go nowhere because that's the information that you're given. When I we did a careers meeting at school, we went around the class asking people what they wanted to be when they grew up, and uh, he got to me and I said I wanted to be an actor, and he said, uh, "Yeah, you, that's not going to happen for you. You should join the army. Settle down. Join the army." And um, that was the sort of you know, it's like a cop a resentment quite easy. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's like I, I hold on to a resentment, and, like, and they can be yeah, but I, I, they can be really powerful and they can drive you. But also, I was going to ask you about this later on. Actually, can grind but, you down a little bit because I, I was I watched a few things and I picked up on a few things about you, and I thought that emotion that you have in you is you can tell it drives you a lot. When like when you you accepted an award after take that at split and everyone had wrote you off, and he was like. That's for you. Fuck off. And yeah. like, I thought to myself, I loved that the speech was epic, but also I thought for you to even give those people the time of day and your happiest moment shows how much you've been burned by how people had wrote you off a lot. So was that in you from day one, would you say, this this emotion that drives you on? Did you feel like you had to put all your eggs in one basket just because people said, you're never going to fucking amount to nothing? Um, the dream wasn't for us. The dream wasn't for me. You, you, you kind of in Stoke on Trent. You, uh, we don't exist because we're in between two TV channels. We're in between Gr- Granada in the north and Central in the south. So we didn't exist at all. You know, the the football results were barely. You know, the highlights were barely on mm-hmm. the TV. In fact, the only time Stoke on Trent was on. The TV was for uh, an advert for Carpet World. Yeah. Drayton Manor Park, still gone Trent, and a bit like we're there, Mum. We're there. We exist. So um, to answer your question, which I think I am, you know, there was uh, the the dream wasn't there for us. You you didn't dare think that big. There's a mentality of that happens on the TV to somebody else. That happens on film to somebody else, and then you know nothing happens at school this is what happened I get my exam results and I've got one D and I can't remember what that was in and uh, me and my mate Tate had five between us that we'd probably got from each other's nans and we went and got five cans of bitter and sat on the bowling green because he hadn't done very well either and uh, I was you know plugging up the courage to go and tell my mum and my mum is uh, fierce She's, incre- she's incredibly fierce. And I just needed to numb this uh, impending information that I'd got to give to her out of my system. So I had these two and a half cans of bitter, 10 Benson and Edges, and went home and knocked on the door. And my mum came to the door and I said, uh, I've got something to tell you. And she said, I've got something to tell you. And I'm like, well, you first. And she said, you're in that band. So, <laughs> thank fuck for thank, that. Yeah, thank fuck for that. So the, yeah. <coughs> the never mind the original drive. Yes, you know the uh, resentment um, can be a huge driving factor, which has also gone into the pie chart of my success. 
but it was I'd got a chance at a dream mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know and this was my only way in and my only way out mm -hmm. so that was the main driving force but what I'm, I'm thinking about resentments a lot now I'm 43 you're 30 right so does that drive you a lot yeah, I was kind of saying on that last podcast where we had the uh, yoga instructor and like uh, my ego isn't completely in control of me, but I am aware that I do operate better when I feel like I've got a point to prove and an enemy and someone to fight against. And I'm, I'm not only going to beat you, I'm going to annihilate you. Yeah. And when the, the media seemed to put you and Gary head to head, I mm -hmm. had a thing. I was watching thinking, if I'm Robbie in that point in time in my head, I'm like, I'm the underdog. And not so not yeah. only do I need to try harder because everyone's like, oh, Gary's the talented one and this, that and the other. I'm not just going to beat you. I'm going to absolutely smash it. Yeah. And the results show that you obviously had a... So that must have been in your mind. At some well, point. I, I'm kind of like, if you punch me, I glass you. Mm -hmm. And um, to varying degrees of success, that's worked for me mm -hmm. in my life. That particular bit with Gaz... Yeah, you're right. It's like I, I'm. I'm not just going to beat you. I'm going to absolutely annihilate mm -hmm. you, and that's going to be my power and my strength. Mm -hmm. um, but at some point in your life, because I have countless resentments that I, I. Well, where do you go to when you're idling? Where does Brian idle at? You know, your brain's in neutral. It goes to Joe Rogan. Um, no, <laughs> I, me I, too. I think. Um, I think. Now I'm getting to a point where I feel like I'm proving my point now. Yeah. Uh, you have a little laugh to yourself about how things are going and whatever, but I don't, you, you're scared. I mean, at my point, I'm scared to congratulate myself too much because it's like, I don't want to get overconfident and then become lazy and then just rest on me laurels. Yeah. Um, I'd hate if you did that. Yeah. So um, I kind of always feel like I've got a point to prove a, a little bit and only when I, I'm really unquestionably where I think I belong, like, well, I Here's what I think will happen feel. for you, though. I think you've got an unquenchable thirst, and I don't think you will ever realise when you're there. What's annoying is I know a lot of people are going to watch this interview who actually say what you and just go, said to me. Yeah. Go, say even Robbie said it. Yeah. Robbie's seen it in your... Yeah. But, uh, but, uh, but, uh, but I'm the same. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like I'm the same. But surely it's better to be unquench um, unquenchable right. um, in your thirst of success than to just be a lazy fucker who sits on the couch because I'm I'm all or nothing me like so before yeah. I, I, well, when that's, I was, well that's them and this is us yeah that's them they get on with that and if they haven't got it they haven't got it mm. but you know it's like I, I've been I'm trying to sort out as a 43 year old where I put all of that to mm. because you know it's like they say that you'll you'll know if you have a resentment or you want revenge then then dig two graves Right. Because you're doing your own as well. Yeah, you're digging your own too. So, uh, and I, but how can I've, you feel that now? Because the way I feel is the reason mine's there is I've got a point to prove. You fucking proved every point. You're, you're the biggest um, selling British male artist ever. Here's the thing: it's not how, enough. Well, what, 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 what would be enough though? <laughs> well, nothing. The, the, well, that's the thing. It's something that I'm coming to realise as a 43 year old. Is is kind of like my ism, whatever I've got that drove me to be the person I am. Uh, is an unrelenting monster that doesn't know when enough's enough. Is that why that um, when you took drugs and alcohol, you were like that with that as well? Yeah. Like, I was really bad at that, mm. but I was incredibly good at mm. it too. I was a sort of an Olympian. I would always be the last person awake. You know, mm. it's like one time, I, I mean, look, I've since ended up in rehab quite a few times, mm. so it's like it's not something that I'm proud of. Mm. But like, I went to the lengths of you know I I'd be awake for four days in a row, and I'd be kind of like the last person at the last party as the dregs, you know. So I was. Um, How does that feel though? Because actually, it's obviously it sounds like somewhat of an achievement. It can actually be a little bit of a lonely scenario to be in when you're the last person awake and everyone else has gone home with their partner or whatever, and you're just sort of left. Yeah, feels, alone at a party it feels dreadful and then you know your body is dependent on these chemicals that you've been putting inside it and then you have to withdraw from that and uh, then it's hellish and uh, that is when I not so much now but when I first got sober I used to watch films and if there was a party scene I, I couldn't carry on watching the film unless there was the morning after or the day after bit in it it was like okay I can weigh up that bit because there's the hangover. Mm -hmm. It's like, I, I understand that. Um, yeah, it was lonely. It was 
desolate. It felt hellish. Um, it's caused ongoing problems probably for the rest of my life. Um, yeah. One thing you said when I was talking to you on the emails and that, because we've been chatting for quite a while now, to be fair, you said um, you have what's called agoraphobia. Yeah. Um, and you said you don't really like going out in public a lot and you like meeting new people is a bit of a funny thing for you. What, what What's that coming from? Don't know, I'm trying to work it out. Yeah. But Because um, people would be watching you now and be like, Robbie Williams, the, the showman, the man who's on stage, belting out tunes, he's the one who's yeah. not very confident. Yeah, no, that's it's it's all an act. Mm-hmm. It is, I'm not that guy, I'm not that confident. But that's part of the, the power thing, the part of the I'll go and show you. I can, mm-hmm. I can do an impression of an alpha male or somebody that's really gregarious or somebody that's super confident, but that's not how I live my life off stage. Um, but is anyone I'm, ever really as confident as they make out? Surely, even Conor like, McGregor. No, but even say even Conor McGregor. Conor McGregor won't be. But the point is, but it, I, it, I, I, you know, it's like he might be near it, but I, I'm completely in love with his impression of somebody yeah. that's incredibly confident. But I, I don't believe that he he totally is. But so isn't that, there's something quite interesting about that though? Because so if you can't be that, but you can be the guy who plays that role, why aren't you that? person then is it just you because it seems like it's only you really that doesn't believe that um yeah or maybe people close to you as well who sort of well i think there's once again i go back to pie charts i think there's a a lot of things that go into the pie chart of what made me become the way i am uh, as regards to uh, public stuff and meeting new people and getting along with them um but I, i when i got sober it was kind of when i was talking about filling in the blanks for my what I was hoping that my career would be, bring me, it's like coke and lager and ecstasy filled in all of those blanks, mm-hmm. and then it took away the medication uh, that I was medicating myself with, and I was left with all the blanks. And I'm still, I haven't had a drink for 18 years. Um, I'm still sort of filling in the blanks. I have an ism. Uh, an alcoholism, an addiction, but also my own special ism that makes me want to isolate, that makes me want to keep away from people, that doesn't make me feel safe when I'm there. And I don't want to be that guy. You know, it's like, I, I don't want to be him. Why not? Uh, what? I don't, want to, I don't want to be the hermetic yeah. isolator. Yeah. Uh, because I like people. I like finding out about people and I like people's company. And I also like to laugh, and I want to laugh more. And um, yeah, it's I'm just I'm in my head a lot, and I you know the ism that I've got takes me away, and I'm very anxious and uh, scared, fearful. Yeah, I'm, I've seen I'm that in, your, in one of your interviews backstage where you'd been <clears throat> you'd been pushed off stage by someone or something like that, and I could see it was like it upset you. And I thought, fucking hell, he's quite a vulnerable person. But then I watched, right, so I've seen this was towards the start of your career. You seem very vulnerable. And then I watched another interview with you about 15 years later, like right afterwards, and I thought, fucking hell, I can see you've had to hone that act of the, and, and, and harden up a bit as well towards Well, the people. thing that you saw was a documentary called Nobody Someday, mm-hmm. and they were coming to document me being on tour. Mm-hmm. As it happens, I just got sober. So I'm, I'm literally, that, that bit of footage where I'm pushed off the, uh, the stage by this guy in Germany, I'm doing a gig in Stuttgart and I'm just singing Supreme or whatever, one of my songs. And then all of a sudden I find myself being pushed up in the air and then I land on the audience and then I land on my back and I look up to the stage and this guy's looking down at me and this guy wants to kill me and he looks like Mickey Winder, the guy that's looking after me backstage and I'm thinking, why does Mickey want to try? This, this is so odd. Because it, it all went so quick, but in those moments, you, you it feels as though, you know, sometimes... So you were sober five then, seconds. You? Yeah. So, oh, yeah. So also, I was dealing with uh, mental illness. I was dealing yeah. with depression. I was dealing with whatever I was covering up by you could, you boozing so much. You were very emotional. Yeah. And, and, and in those moments when people get sober for the first time and they put a, an amount of time together, they're the most damaged, the most vulnerable, the most sensitive. Mm-hmm. So that, that film, Nobody Someday, go watch the, uh, the bit where he pushes me off stage. The guy 
um, thought he was, bless him, he wasn't very well. And he thought that I wasn't the real Robbie Williams. And, you know, yeah. as you do. <laughs> that guy looks too sober to be Robbie Williams. Yeah, like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, like the, exactly. Like the uh, the Paul conspiracy from the Beatles. Yeah. You know, yeah. Fall, yeah, yeah. Or, or Avril, you Avril Levine's shoes? got one as well. Apparently. Avril Levine has oh, one. Really? Avril Levine yeah. died and then you, someone else is now playing her. Do you believe that? Or um, because you've been around Avril? Uh, she's she's not the same person yeah. that she used to be. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and this will now be clipped up and added added to, to, yeah, yeah, to yeah, yeah. conspiracy compilation with, with the with the dramatic music yeah. playing oh, underneath yeah. YouTube. We don't need the dramatic music yeah. Yeah. on conspiracy videos. We you, don't need you stop, fucking love conspiracy. Stop being so instructive. I love all that. Yeah, I absolutely love conspiracies. That, that, like us. You you do take a lot of time. Like obviously, you take a lot of time on tour. That's how you found us. You find weird, kooky people to watch who don't really have a real message, but just latch onto other people's messages and then pretend. And, um, and you, you say, what? And then, so do you watch a lot of conspiracy theory? And that must feed a little into the- um, you, you went to Bohemian Well, Grove. the mental illness. Not the Bohemian mental illness, Grove. but wanting to- um, But the guy at Bohemian Grove's beginner shit. Yeah, man, that's- So I, I'm, yeah, I kind of, with the invention of the internet, and all the information being gathered at the same time, it's very, very easy and entertaining and enjoyable and not, I would suggest, best for your mental health. You can find yourself going down a rabbit oh, hole. completely. And it's a lot of fun, but if you mix that with marijuana, <laughs> you can find yourself in a house in Beverly Hills going to your wife, We've got to move to Montana. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's a bomb just about to be dropped. It's going to go off and uh. we're going to lose the whole coastline. <laughs> so, you know. I what, what's her response to that, by the way? She would have gone to Montana at sure. that time. She would have just gone, okay, baby, let's do She'd it. She'd go, okay, let's go. Yeah, no, I can't say that she but was that, doing that. Yeah. You know how you're sort of well connected in that? Have you ever been uh, confronted by anyone who's mentioned Illuminati shit and any, anything like that? You must have been because there was a point where it yes. seemed like you were untouchable. There was a point where I remember the, the day that you got that massive album deal and you were sort of being shepherded through public, but everyone was trying to get your picture. Yeah. And everyone went, he's the most successful man in the world. He's gonna be bigger than the Beatles, all these guys. So are you suggesting that since my decline in my popularity, my membership to the Illuminati has been revoked? No, but I think your paranoia is suggesting that. Ah. Um, <laughs> but, but so at that point, you your rise, uh, like it almost seemed a little bit bizarre because it's like you were an amazing artist. Like I remember loving you as a, kid like being like oh, god that guy's gonna be and to some extent when you were talking about that i felt a little bit not resentful towards you but oh talking about what uh like how, what a great what, like how showman what a showman you were and you sort of uh like i took that as real instruction as a kid and sort of like well we you know i this is how to be a showman um and then you get Explain this massive why you felt resentful though. Yeah. Uh, maybe I felt a little bit, maybe you, as a kid, you sort of really latch onto that. You feel a little bit like that's reality. You that's believe it. it. You believe it. And yeah. you're like, I can do that as well. And I think I've not been on a similar journey to yours and not anything nearly as intense. Maybe some slightly different conclusions. But it is interesting to hear you talk about that. And Isn't that what being a showman is though, Shirley? You have, you're wanting people to believe a certain... We, we I didn't smoke, but when you were smoking, I said to you, I think there's like that real artist angst and quite a few people have been on our podcast and done that thing where their identity is completely the pain that they're in mm -hmm. and they don't seem able to escape that pain or they've now found a way to monetize that pain so they almost have to stay there. So it's a little bit like that. I'd people. like to think that, you know, I, I'm not saying I, I wear you. my pain lightly. I'm not I'd, I'd like to, I'd like to think now that is my truth. You know, it's like, I don't, I don't want to be, I don't want to, you know, oh, 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 woe is me. This is, yeah. you know, it's like I, I'm now sort of, I was in that and now I'm outside of that having a look at it and going, oh, okay, how do we deal with the rest of, of, how do I deal with the rest of my life knowing that this is, this is the truth yeah. about me? It's like, what do we do with that? Is it true though? Yeah. Why? Uh, why? The, the whole thing, well, there's a book called Reveal and it's 518 pages of why. Um, Hi. It, there's a, there's a not, you know, it's like I've been doing therapy since I was 21. So we've only, got, we've got what, two hours, two and a half hours, three hours, if I'm interested. Yeah. You know, I don't think I can two explain it all. Plus also, it's like I know, you know, but it gets an awful lot of people into trouble. And I also, you know, 
love a lot of those people that I'd be saying, well, this happened, this happened, this happened, and this happened. Is that awkward when you're writing a book and you, you sort of really want to tell your story, but you also don't want to... Because everyone has shitty things happen to them by people that they love. And ultimately, you forgive them in 10 years or five years. Maybe for me and you, it would be 25. Yeah. Um, you kind of want to tell the whole story accurately, but also you don't want to throw people under the bus. Has it also well, made that's, you... That, that's, I'll just ask the question. That's, that's not what the book is about. Right. You know, it's like this isn't a book in my voice talking about my life. Right. That's that's for another time. This is very different. My friend Chris Heath, who's over there, All right. um, follows uh, has followed me around. He did a book with me called Feel in two thousand and two thousand and four, uh, and it was well acclaimed, critically acclaimed. People loved the book for its honesty and its rawness. Mm. And people were coming up to me and saying, "I can't believe how honest you've been in that book." And it was right. like, "Well, to be honest with you, I haven't read it, so I don't know what I said." Um, and I love hanging out with Chris, and I, I wanted to do a follow-up to that book, and um, the follow-up to that book has been Chris following me around with a with a notepad and a, you know a, a recording equipment and following and recording my every movement. So it's not the classical biography that you would think it is. It's sort of me slagging off celebrities in parts Good. and in other parts being gossipy yeah. but in all the parts being thoughtful and hopefully have you ever had anyone come funny. back to you when, when you've said something on an interview because you do you drop people in it regularly I've noticed that mm. um, I was going to say did it make you assess some of those situations as well did you ever think wait I wasn't right in that looking back you were like shit actually yeah 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 many times but I, I I do want to entertain and I have limited talents and I see it like a bit like a bar fight. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like if I'm on the TV, I want to make that moment a golden you moment. You want to that moment. You know, like, like you did when you were growing up and you'd see people on chat shows or you'd see people when I was growing up, it'd be sort of like Freddie Starr, Muhammad Ali, uh, Rod Hull and Emu and uh, all of these people that would go on and make like TV gold. And I see it as kind of like my duty to go on and do TV gold. Well, you're not Sometimes there to make up the numbers, are you? No, it's like, I know I want to win. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm really competitive. Mm -hmm. And I see it a bit like a bar fight. And I will grab the first thing that comes to my mind. And I will use it. Is that competitiveness, as, though? Going back to take that, you're, obviously you're, a, you're in a five-man group. Was there a little bit of you that thought, I don't want to make up the numbers. I, want, I have to be one of the main faces if that's what, how it's going to go down. No, I, I thought that there was uh, a problem with the mechanics of how people looked after in the band. Mm -hmm. And um, it, I, I have an ability to be very resentful mm. and use that as a power. And if I feel as though there's an injustice, um, did I want to be one of the main people? I didn't even know I was allowed to. All right. You know, it was be, even, I was more like touching my forelock yeah. at the time. Thank you, sir. Thank you. This is ten pounds for the video, sir. Thank you very much, mm. sir. You know, so I, I didn't even know that that was a possibility for me because the dream was so big. Mm. But then somebody suggested that I do, and then yeah, I've kind of found my feet and wanted to be more than and thought, oh well, I, I sang could it be magic and I can do this. And people seem to respond. They don't say I'm shit. You stood out straight away. So, but. Um, Whereas one of the other lads, not so much. Do you know what I mean? Well, they, look, look. You know, they dear friends of mine. Mm. I've been through a lot with them. They're they're family members, mm -hmm. and family members in every sense of the word. Is that weird now, though? After at one point you had a massive falling out with them, and you said a lot of things about them, and now it's like, well, actually, I do forgive them mm. for everything. That I, I always loved them. Uh -huh. I always loved them, and I love them now. On that but show, why didn't you come and meet them? Oh, well, I'll tell you about that too. Uh -huh. But the thing is, it's like I, I, go, I go fucking atomic, mm -hmm. you know, and it's like if you are upset, like with the Gallaghers, that'll, that'll roll on and on and on and on. It's like if I get miffed or if I get upset or if I feel as though you're putting me down, I just, I want to kill you. Mm -hmm. And there was, there was a, what? Th there's that, you've got the same thing. Yeah, we right? have talks where I sort of, he reigns me in a lot. Right. You know I mean? Well, Talking you know, there down. was. I, I thought the setup of take that was unfair, mm. and I thought it was unjust, and that made me rageful. Mm. And the stuff that happened when I left take that was like I was awful with Gaz, um, and I thought as though I had good reason. You know, not now, not as a forty-three-year-old with a bit of time under my belt. Looking back on it, you know, he didn't know that somebody in the band had this in him. 
that this atomic sort of anger where I, I'm going to make mm. sure that, you know, not only do I win, but I stamp all over you and I keep stamping. Yeah, you, his career was pretty fucked, but I don't think that that was all your fault, to be fair. It was, he just didn't release the right records after he, after he went solo. But There was a lot of problems in there, yeah. I think, and that, that must... You um, could see that in this documentary that I watched yeah. where they did the reunion. Did you see that? Yeah. Where, you were supposed to come and meet them afterwards. Like they all met together, and you sort of did a video recorded message where you sort of you said positive things, but you didn't show up, and they were well, all there was clearly a, there good. Was, there was a slight stitch up, right, with that documentary. Um, I stitched myself up with my attitude in the documentary quite a bit, um, but there was a slight stitch up because the the, the thing was. We're all going to leave messages to each other. That was what I was told. Right. So I was sort of like, I leave a message to Howard, and and I'm thinking that Howard's going to leave a message back to me, and that's it. I didn't know about the the meetup. The meetup that was going to. They happen. made you look a bit of a cunt, there, didn't they? Well, well, we, yeah, but so what? You know, it, it, it's all right. I felt bad for the boys because at the end of the documentary, the premise was the boys were going to get back together at this hotel, and then maybe Robbie Williams was going to turn up. <laughs> I didn't know that was happening. And that was when they played my messages to all the boys. So this was scripted though by the, the people behind it the whole time. Yeah. Yeah. So Do, do you really watch that back? There was one of the lads, <clears throat> the one who was a DJ, he was like, I wanted it I wanted to end it. Me. If you watch if like you, you want to end his life. It, did you ever watch the uh, <clears throat> what was the, the 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 documentary when they'd get E17 together mm. and uh, oh, the reunion. A1, the called. reunion. Uh, that was awkward though. It yeah. was no, but it was it was very entertaining. Yeah. It was a great watch. But watch everybody's story about those times. Yeah. It caused mental illness. Mm. It caused depression. It caused um, you know as much as there were highs. A lot of watch everybody's story and it's all working they're, they're with all people broken generally people. that closely in that length of time. It's hard, isn't it, Lawrence? I, no, it is. But I, I also think um, it's interesting because obviously you you got into a band, but it wasn't like it, the way that I saw take that was like it's like the like as, an, as a kid you're like it's the Beatles. So all these guys have come from the same place. You've all got a common goal, and it was very similar to the way that you thought it would be. But naively as a kid, you're like these guys. They all know. They love each other. Like why would they argue? Like why would any of this happen? And I think there's like anxiety around that kind well, of dynamics I, I, it's not true I can't is it? say that we didn't love each other I, I, I would have liked to, have, to love each other in a different kind of way I don't mean man love right okay. I just mean you know it would have been there was no chance for us to uh, be a cohesive unit but also at the same time how often do you get five guys together that then go off and sell 19 million albums and they go into the stratosphere that not many people in the history of the world have ever been in. So who, who knows how to deal and manage no one's ready and maintain but that. But people could have done that better from what we see. I mean, especially when you see the characters, people could have done that better. Yeah. Did you look at other bands and look at their dynamic? Because obviously you guys, so you guys are doing all the biggest shows at those times. Were you looking at other bands and being like, oh, I'd rather be in Boys Own? Or what, do you know what I mean? That sort of thing. Like, I think I'd have preferred E17's records. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But did Everybody you... in the House of Love's a tune. Deep, I'm going deep, baby. Yeah. Deep, deep down. Um, you you look like someone who should have been in that I think I may have. I think I should have been. I think I should have been in E17. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, but we were, we, were the, we were the daddies. You know, there was nobody that, was, that could match what us was for the record good sales, bit? gigs. You know, like when I'm looking at a bunch of like, because one thing that hit me when I'm watching this documentary is the screaming girls and shit like that. I'm like, fucking hell, that would have been mint. Like that, that would have been the funnest thing ever. Getting mobbed by girls all the time. I mean, life's great. What well, must have been awesome? Was it fun? Well, the temperature of what was happening back home is weird too. You know, so I had this, uns for me, I'm just saying this is my experience, this is not anybody else's experience. What was happening was we had uh, this unsafe work environment where I didn't feel appreciated and, you know, the, the opposite of that was happening. So I didn't feel safe there. I came home and uh, I became famous. And you think that that's going to be absolutely amazing and instantly I found out that it wasn't because where you used to be able to go to with 
anonymity you now can't and now not only can't you can't go there but you're going to get your head kicked in because being famous in stoke is different to being famous in london yes all right yeah i understand and that let me qualify that with my the, the place that i'm from i love it to bits and i love the people but also we do breed a lot of psychos and you, you, you can't be invisible anymore. You can't make yourself small. You can't disappear. The built-in radar for danger doesn't work the way it used to because mm. you, you haven't got any of your tricks because you're too, uh, too visible. And, uh, and I like going out. Yeah. So this was a problem. Not only that, we sort of had outside the house at any given time, there could be like 10 girls to 150 girls just waiting outside Why is that a problem, house. Robbie? I don't, I don't how, want to, how old were the girls? Well, they were, you know, they were all under 16. Oh, right. You know, so... Instant problem. Fucking, Annoying, you know. high, shrill. Could you not have just sent someone out and go, has any of you over the age... No, <laughs> that's... Could you again, not have sent at least one of yours out? It's funny that that's your first thought, is Well, that that's exactly what I would have done. Go and pick the legal ones out, as no, you no, would call funny. it. Right. Well, the, the, uh, there'd be that many people outside the house that the police used to have to cordon off the road because it wasn't safe for cars. In Stoke. Yeah, in Stoke. Right. And I, I'd sort of, and my mom was beside herself because now, you know, you sort of make yourself vulnerable. Mm. Yeah, I, I'm the man of the house. It's just my mom and my sister. And I, I know that people are going to burglars. I know because I've been told. Yeah. People are coming to the house. There's other stuff that went on where I was not very safe, to say the least. Is that, is that what you were referring to? Where you, oh, um, in the email. So can we can we sort of give people a hint of that sort of story? Because um, to repackage it, yeah, uh, you got involved with girls and that, and maybe one of them. Was it wasn't no, no, it wasn't the girls so much. It was something else. Let's just say my life became in danger, right? And uh, it wasn't safe for me to be. I mean, I'd love to say, I'd, I'd love to say, Why can't I can't, you? no, I can't. I don't know. I don't know. How are man? I don't know. No one's going to get you in here. Yeah. I, 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 don't, I don't know right. how much trouble you can get in by saying that. You won't, it's, a, it's not like you're naming names. So. Yeah. Mm. I, well, I used to sleep with a um, a gun, let's put it that way. Right. And what a, was that gun's name? It was called Desi Eagle. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Derek. Derek Eagles. Derek Eagles. Yeah. And um, this is like when I was 17. In England? Yeah. So you carried a gun with you around? Well, I did at the house. Because yeah. you'd been told. Well, there was, there was stuff that was about to happen to me. And um, yeah, it was, it was touch and go, which also has sort of caused a, a, a problem with feeling safe, probably for the rest of my life. Yeah. You know, it's sort of, you experience that kind of, this trauma that's about to happen where you're, you're gonna end your life. And, um, you know, you need to protect yourself, but you also need to protect your mum and your sister too. Do you, ever fe do you feel in danger much with me? Because you are as recognisable as it gets in Britain. Yeah. D do you ever feel like any if anyone at any moment, do you have that when you're walking around the streets or anything like that where you're like... No, not, not, not now. But mm. there was a period in my life where people just either wanted to kill me or punch my face in. Mm. And that, that was like the... Uh, What's the, what's the period when you're 16, 17, 18? You're in formative Puberty. years. Oh, right. What's yeah. it called? Formative yeah. years. Formative, formative years. years. Mm -hmm. So, and um, I was a bit of an animal at the same time. I, I wanted to go out and I didn't want that to stop me. And I, I shouldn't have. And I, I got into a few scrapes in a few places that I shouldn't have been mm -hmm. in. But uh, yeah, I used to have, I used to sleep with um, an aerosol can underneath my pillow too with Just a lighter. Case. Brilliant. That's clever. Yeah, it was because I'd seen James Bond yeah. and I was going to use this as a flamethrower. Yeah. All of these so things happen. So you're that wasn't in the Millennium uh, music video. No. no. So, so you, you, you're, I'm a road man. So you're asking me, you're asking me uh, what, which, what was it fun? To be honest with you. I think the, the girls. The the, well, the girls, yeah, look, yeah. Uh, that, Let it go. That was, that was great. Mm. That bit of my life was wonderful. Mm. That carried on for a long it time. It did, didn't it, mate? Until I met Ida. Mm. In fact, it became that great that I didn't know how I was going to give up that can you, to be a married person. Yeah. So how, how many... Um, can you name some people I might know who you sort of... Slept with? Yeah. Is it? <laughs> What? I tell you off camera, but not on camera. Mm. I get into a lot of trouble. This is you've another... slept with a lot of famous women, though, haven't you? You were quite prolific. 
I was a prolific swordsman. Mm. Yeah, Kids. I mean, no, no, uh, no, Harry Styles, but yeah. Oh, I, is he is he doing bits right now? Oh, he's it? doing bits. He's doing. Bits. Are you proud of him? Do you say, I'm "Look proud, at what"? Yeah. Oh, you're doing me. Yeah. yeah, I I hand the sword on to you, <laughs> my son. <laughs> go forth, unscrews it, go forth yeah, and multiply. This is, you know, so going back to was it fun? Yeah, of course. There was lots of bits that were fun because there was just experiences that were blowing our mind. We'd yeah. sort of go from yeah. Flicks nightclub where there was one man and a dog watching us to GMEX arena where there's 8,000 people to then to a stadium where there's 50,000 people. And it's all mind blowing, life affirming, incredible stuff. Just the stuff that was going on behind the camera was uh, too much for me to deal with, to enjoy it fully. But I think that's, everybody's story you what watch you any you watch any like behind the music and then it turns sour yeah. have you, you, been, know, you must have met other guys like Justin Timberlake seems like quite a well adjusted individual or I don't know him so I don't he's know he's pre-programmed or what? he was Disney programmed from day one wasn't he it's not like you growing up in Stoke yeah <laughs> like you weren't ready for this like the way yeah I I, I don't know you know it's like I, I know that I there's one person that's really famous that I'm I won't mention his name but I'm a massive fan of him, a similar sort of age, and he crushes it, and he's incredible. And I remember just having a conversation with him on the phone, and we just went on for, for like 45 minutes going, and you feel that way, and you think that way, and, and it was it was great to know that I, because you can be quite isolating, the yeah. experience that I'm having in this lifetime mm. uh, can be quite isolating. It's just great to know that there's somebody else going, that's exactly how I feel too. So yes, there are people, but like Justin Timberlake, he's incredible too. Right. But uh, you know, it's like, but the Americans as a whole are very, very good at giving you their representative. I'm not saying that Justin's representative on stage and in interviews isn't him, because yeah. it might be, he's, you know, He's, he's incredible at what he does but who knows you know it's like who knows there's always an element in that show I mean, you're it? talking about people that you've met before you sent us a photograph of you and Tupac uh, what was it like meeting him do you really meet Tupac he's the first yeah. person I've ever spoken to in my life who met Tupac and to me like Tupac is like the greatest ever like a rap do you know what I mean yeah he was uh, we were at a Versace party I've been invited over there by Donatella I think I was singing I can't remember Either which way, I was with Tupac and he was wonderful. Mm -hmm. And I'm big hip hop head, mm -hmm. have been for, since I can remember. And here I was with a hero of mine. And look, you know, he is incredibly charismatic, uh, looked amazing in clothes, proper man crush. Wanted to tell him that I know his lyrics, <laughs> didn't, didn't do it, just dropped one and he didn't hear it. And yeah. then I thought I'll back away. Um, but he was really uh, affable and you know he was inclusive and he his it was it was weird you know it was weird what was weird not the meeting of the two pack was him working with uh, the LAPD was his security right. and what we were getting up to at the time that was nefarious that was weird it was kind of like it's um, weird because the are you okay if who, we do this <laughs> yeah i am i going to get in trouble if i come to america yeah, that, don't that worry, was strange white. it was like you it's lapd there's yeah. a lot of rumors that the lapd were involved in the, his murder as well uh because they were employed by suge knight who some people think was involved in the killing of him, i can so. neither confirm or deny that i, I know bet anything you, i bet you've looked into that, that. i know, I know for a fact you've looked oh into yeah that. top conspiracy it's one of them, yeah. yeah. I've got my, I've got my own thoughts. Shug's a nice guy. I met him. He was <laughs> lovely a, guy. Lovely guy. Actually, my I hope mom, his prison stints go well. My mum came. My mum came what to Los Angeles, well. and uh, she said, "I've just been outside, and this chap came over to me in this big car, and he came out, and he was like, motherfucking this, and you motherfucking that, because I parked in front of him, and I said, how dare you." talk to me like that I'll have you know that my son lives in this house and he will come and get you and I said to this man what was his name and he said Shuggy Knight Shug Knight and Good she, night. Was, she was winding me up but she completely got me I was like you've told Shug Knight that Robbie Williams will get him <laughs> it was a good stitch up by my mum <laughs> so I was with Tupac mm -hmm. at the Versace show and he was a yeah, charming man um, yeah, it's incredible. precious that now, though, isn't it? When you when people who 
were the greatest at what they did and you had that time with them like no one will ever get that yeah and I've met I've met and been around a lot of them too yeah what, what, what stage were you at your career by there huh? what stage you were you at when you met him no no I wasn't in my prime at all this I just left take that and I oh, was really? searching for a direction what do you consider your prime uh, yeah. Nebworth Nebworth yeah. is which I knew going into that weekend that it was all downhill from there Really? really, it was like this was. It, it can't get any Never bigger. Never the one where you come out upside down. Yeah, and it's just like un. I've been watching stuff like that, and I was like, Jesus, Jesus was, Christ. Uh, yeah, I mean, how many people was that? One hundred and thirty-five thousand each night. And was that more than the other people who'd done Nebworth? Oasis, yes. Okay, just checking. Yeah, yeah. yeah. One extra, extra night longer than yeah. the Oasis. Uh, boys did, did you, because did there was so much demand because there was there was a lot of I could have done more nights yeah. but I did I just kept it at three. I can wish you had because I couldn't get any tickets so. oh, right, yeah, okay. I think I think we can we can sort you out can we sort them oh, out okay, next time yeah, yeah, sure. please. We'll get yeah please the next Nebworth front, the front next front Nebworth yeah. I could still do it yeah. I could do one night at Nebworth yeah thanks with a lot thanks, of, for, thanks for the belief with a lot of support with a lot of singing along ah, I mean, yeah yeah, no, no. Listen, I still say I do. I do all right with tickets. I've seen just, those videos. I, I fucking just, know you do. Just yeah. performed to 1.2 million people this year, yeah. so stuff's still good on the live front. I mean, I, I can see uh, <laughs> yeah, 60, well. 70,000 people like constantly in these big stadiums. Yeah. And that you're doing all over Europe. What's it like to sing in front of like that many people? Um, How does it feel? Well. There's many times that you feel as though it's that euphoric and that amazing that you wish to die. <laughs> In really? that you just think that I actually can't get any better than this right now. The feeling that I'm feeling, it, you should just end it now and I'd be happy and that'd be it. Obviously, I'm not going to do that. So I've got a wonderful life and I've got charming children <laughs> and a wonderful wife that would miss me very much. So I'm not going anywhere. But that's as good as it gets. On the other hand... Yeah is the ism that works and this you know the shy unsure scared some nights it's 70,000 people looking at you and I'm terrified because really? it's really odd it's really weird to be that person that all of those eyeballs that are centered on and I don't know who I'm going to get each night whether I turn up Rob Robert Williams or whether Rob, Robbie Williams turns up and sometimes Robbie Williams doesn't turn up and I have to do it by myself. And uh, when he doesn't turn up, I'm just jelly-legged and petrified. Though nobody can tell. Right. Nobody can tell, which is kind of some amazing trick that I've got. Not even my wife. You know, I'll come off and she'll go, babe, it was incredible. And I went, I had an absolute nightmare tonight. You know, it can be- I get that though. Yeah, I've I've had podcasts before, and I know this is nowhere near the same thing. But like where people have thought, oh, that was good, and I'm like, that was a fucking shambles. Yeah, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So uh, exactly the same. I've seen you did a, a review of. But when people song. say, so when people say that was good, do you actually then give them a detailed explanation of why it was? So like um, the Eddie Hall podcast, for example, I, smashed it. I, I was like, well, yeah, because Eddie was great. Eddie was the perfect guest. I was actually a mess because I was like in awe of this guy who I've looked up to for five years and then I realised like I was stumbling over my words all the time Things, but that was covered up because Eddie was so good do you uh, know uh, what I mean Mr. Mr. Hall um, one more question yeah, yeah, one really final thing my yeah. wife loves you um, hey, what an inspiration he is yeah another Stoke boy we, yeah we've got because two I, kings of Stoke now. yeah I I, I I watched that at a time that I wasn't very well mm -hmm. this year um, I had a problem with my back, mm -hmm. got, I got arthritis in the bottom of my back and I had a slip disc in the middle of it. And then I went on tour and there was a lot of stress revolving around it because there was some financial issues where if I didn't complete what I had to complete, then we were gonna be poor and I couldn't walk and I couldn't lie down. So I was, I've been in a bad way this year. My That's weird though, because I'm now looking at you like a man who's going to work to make sure he can provide for his family and whatever. Yeah, I do, yeah. But nobody would look at you in that way because it's Robbie just racking the millions up and that's what people would think. Oh yeah, but there was going to be something bad happened if I didn't, mm. if I didn't right. uh, follow through with the commitments that I've got. It was going to be minus stuff. It wasn't me going out to you know make money. It was me actually now I've got to go and do this so we don't get minus this amount of money. Yeah. I couldn't, and you know, it's like, I love my kids, I love my wife, and I'm very proud that I get to um, furnish their life 
in an amazing fashion. Mm -hmm. And here was something that was going to happen where I may not be able to do that. And it was incredibly stressful. And I was having injections, like 15 to 20 injections each night to get me to get on stage. And then in between those gigs, I'd sort of be racked in pain. So I, I spent months in abject pain and uh, it had an effect on me and I ended up in uh, ICU. Uh, something went on in my brain and they found something up there and it was scary. Anyway, uh, so I come out of ICU and I go home and I'm watching the Eddie Hall podcast and I just need, it was, it was the right time, right place. I'm very grateful for that podcast because, you know, it's sort of the strength that's needed for him to be him you know, oh, he's fucking inspirational, like, isn't he? Yeah, it, at that moment in my life, I really needed to hear that message mm -hmm. because you know there was a a stoicism that um, that he has that's um, yeah inspirational. Go back to your live shows. You on one of the documentaries I watched, you were sort of pulling a, apart your own songs. You were like, oh, and this chorus is shit, and that's fucking, and and I, I just go through the motions sometimes. Like you seemed a bit pissed off in this at this point in your interview. Do you still feel that way? Because that was like quite a while ago. Yeah, there's any I, songs where you're like, oh, fuck, no, this again. plagued by self hatred and plagued by self doubt. Yeah. I'm still trying to figure out why that is, but I'm sure it's in the book somewhere. Uh, throwing back to the book uh, which page um, and it's incredibly uncomfortable it's mm. incredibly uncomfortable to deal with because mm. I, I found as though it's a place that I'm used to and it's a place that I find comfort in and uh, I don't know how to get out of it I don't know how to reprogram the brain to um, uh, one would be nice to be calm and serene that would be great but just to reprogram the brain to think positively about anything including myself mm. I'm better than I was in my 20s but I'm still not great uh, but I'm, I'm much better than I was in my 20s yeah I, I when people used to write bad things about me I'd be like I can do better than that mm. Mm. I, 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 yeah that's that's good but I can go 10 deeper than that so you I used actually, to want to I used to you want you made a quote once I just, I've just got a flashback here of um this is when Eminem came out and he said, um, he, he made a line about how are you going to, um, how are you going to hurt someone who strangles himself? Yes. And you quoted that in an interview around that time. I thought, oh, fuck, oh Robbie Williams listened to Eminem. Oh, yeah. And, Big um, Eminem fan. But then you were like, that line sums up the way I am about me. Like how but I, I'd want to, but I'd want to be competitive about people saying bad things about me. Mm. So I'll, I'll, I'll batter you at that. What about this? What about that? What so about where did that? the strength come from then? When everyone had fucking written you off and said, he's, he's nothing without take that. If you're such a negative person, you had to believe in yourself in order to pick yourself up from there's, that point. There's somebody else in there too. You know, there's, um, I don't know. Was that Robert or Robbie? But I, I don't know, but there's a giant in there too. Mm -hmm. You know, there is, there is this whole hodgepodge of this uh, self-hatred and self-doubt but somewhere, somewhere the in there, what the, the I think it's ego both ways. Yeah. Maybe the, the self hatred and the, and the self doubt is ego as well as the ego being the I'm great. But somewhere in there is somebody that can channel strength, mm -hmm. and uh, it may not be real. But I convinced a lot of people that it was. Uh -huh. So was it real, or is it real? Yeah, you know. But I do believe there's somebody in there too that's. You know, that's Channel Zeus. The, you know? And at what point did you realise after you'd been written off that um, I made it back and now I'm actually going to be stronger on my own than I ever was in the band? I was buoyed by cocaine, ecstasy, and Drambuie at the time. Mm -hmm. So I, I was sort of self medicating. So I don't know if there was any thoughts about what was happening next or how it was going to happen. But you know, when. People just, I was, I was actually, as long as the, there was the self-doubt and self-hatred, but there was also this blinkered view that I'm just going to get this. Mm -hmm. That's what's going to happen. Weirdly. Is that that pos positive visualisation that Conor McGregor was always on about? Yeah, but I didn't know that I was doing that. Mm -hmm. I, I wasn't employing that as a tactic to overcome this other stuff. It's like, no, I'm going to go here. I'm going to take on the world and I'm going to win. 
you seem a lot less calculated in that sense than some other people who seem to map out things and then just go down well, that I, route. And I think anything. they know more about it now. Right. Mm. Back in 95, 96, the, the secret, the documentary hadn't come out. There mm. wasn't books about it. There was no talk about positive mental visualization. But when I read about it and heard about it and watched these documentaries, then I thought to myself, oh, well, that's what I did. Mm. It was like... I, Tunnel I, vision. I, yeah. It's like, you, you, you must have it. I don't you know. don't have it. Yeah. Why not? I don't know. I, I, I think I've it's, got it. it's, you do have it because you're going to go to wherever you want to go to and you will have it. But I can just see it and feel it in him. It's palpable, the, mm. the, the power and the, the intensity, I suppose. Yours is more of a gentle, uh, positive mental visualization. Do you do that or not? Um, no. Uh, it's really interesting you say that because actually I, d I just don't think I'm the same character in public as I would be privately sometimes. And so I'll tone it back a little bit, maybe because down the years people have said to me, you're a little bit too intense. What, in private? In private and in public. With your positive mental visualization? I'm maybe, not sure where we went. Or maybe just like in general personality side of things. Right, so people okay. just see it less. And that's why I find it quite interesting when you were saying you, you like being around people. I like being around people, but I used to really love being around people and maybe love being around people a little bit too much. And so I went the opposite way. So I can almost appreciate that you want to take yourself out of that environment a little bit but or, I want to go back into that environment yeah exactly now. yeah I'm going to go back why? because because like I said I like people and I like their company mm. and um, do you like all people though like do you, do you find you're one of those people when you go to those parties you can get on with absolutely anyone um, yeah but it takes it out of me mm -hmm. you know it's because I don't have the the medication that you need to make those sort of things enjoyable do you, you think know? you were in the room at that those times when you were with those people so through what you know, you say you feel by trying and buoy and drugs. And mm -hmm. do you, how often do you think you were in the room and sort of present in those situations in those times? Well, I was having it. So I was present in the fact that I was being highly, you know, I was full octane. But it wasn't me because it was an exaggerated version of myself. I had a lot of fun. A lot of fun happened. But then there was the obvious terrible nightmare of the come down of whatever yeah. was happening the Fucking next day. Uh, so was I myself in those... Um, Situations. What was your drug of choice? What was your favourite? Cocaine. Yeah, I thought so. Yeah, cocaine. Uh, but ecstasy was the one that did it. Mm -hmm. it. Was the first taking of the tablet, and then the the feeling and the euphoria, and uh, the thing, the feeling of uh, we should always yeah. live like this every day, all day. And I really tried. Did you have any experiences? I think you mentioned in an email where you were like, where I was on stage and I was off me tits. Like, have you ever had any things where you were like, I can't believe I did that? Um, yeah, nothing that I could say that wouldn't get me in trouble. Oh, for fuck's sake, Mo most, most of the time, most of the time, <laughs> most of the time for my, yeah, intake that, we danced, we danced so hard. Uh -huh. uh, we, the, the, the show took so much out of us that you, you really couldn't take anything to to get you to to enjoy it so we were good boys we worked really hard and most of my adult life i've been sober and i've definitely been mainly 99 percent of the time sober whilst i've been on stage uh but there have been there have been blips let's say um but but it wasn't it wasn't fun you know it wasn't a, a fun thing that happened there was this time when i was off my head in front of eighty thousand people and that was a laugh it wasn't it was it was a nightmare uh -huh. you know um so i intend not to do that again why did i say something did i say you something said, on uh, you, you said that you were you'd had a few experiences with girls and shit like that on stage and uh uh I, i'll we'll leave oh, that for okay. this we'll do a second podcast can i go for smoke <laughs> yeah oh, absolutely okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You're really good with, um, are you blessed with the same ability to have conversations when you're not doing Yeah, Yeah, that's part of the problem. Yeah. At all times. Pretty yeah. much. Whether you are drunk or not. The, but how it started basically was we were like having all these chats and, you know, we better stop fucking recording this at some point because we, we, he would have me like crying, laughing and I was like. It's not happened since. How did you meet? Um, Skype. We, we worked for a bang average YouTube Grindr. channel together. And, uh Cut the middleman out. Let's make our own money. And oh, that's really? what that's what they say about grinder very often. Um, let me let me ask you this question too. It was like because I know that you were uh, hampering for uh, um, sponsorship. Yeah, and I just wondered how that was going to happen. However, because mm. 
you're allowed to say whatever you want, however you want to say it. Mm. And an awful lot of the stuff, you know, you would never get away with on terrestrial TV. No. You would never get away with in most living rooms, which is why I find you entertaining mm-hmm. and why I watch, you know, every podcast that you do. How do you go from not having, uh, what's it called? Not sponsorship. Uh, sponsorship, yeah. Like yeah. Funding, how, does, how, does, how does somebody from Coral go, actually, no, this is a goer. We're going gonna, we're gonna well, to give Co- them some money. Yeah. Coral's just the start. We've been approaching major music artists and trying to get them to fund our projects. Um, I'm one of them. Yeah. Um, Kylie said you'd be good to chat to. Right, right, right. Um, and so uh, we knew someone at the top who when it went to tender they said why don't you pitch for it yeah. and we put in a legit pitch luckily which, somebody at coral was a very smart lad shout out elliot and, shout out to elliot and a lot of other people were smart and i mean it Stoke takes massive the problem is it takes a lot of middle-aged white men to get through who all go whoa i couldn't show this to my kids or whatever yeah but i think after one chat where you say to someone it's much more real What's your or, demographic 18 to 35 male really right why well, but I mean, they're big on buying my records. It's it's huge, sort of huge. it's it's expanding though. It's 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 changing on that. Do you know what I mean? The bigger the number so gets. So what's the? Um, I'm, I'm sure there's a lot you can't talk about. But is there like what are the plans for the True Geordie channel? It's interesting. You say um, that. We can't tell you yet. We, well, we, we can we, tell you. We yeah. can't tell. We can't sound camera yet. Basically, yeah, we we we're, we're starting a business. Basically, right. We're, we're going to have our own company, and we've got long term plans where. Um, this is always going to happen. The podcast is always going to happen. But Lawrence, we, True, Jordy, and Robbie Williams. We want to PLC. Always happen. This yeah, is yeah. it. We want to grow it as a the front three. RBL. Yeah, yeah. front three. <laughs> front three. Finally. I do it. Yeah, Finally. Finally. a good one. Um, Snap Monday. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, so yeah, we want to make. You must much be excited about that. Bigger things. I, I want to get big, big, big fucking deals. I want to make as much money as I can. You're gonna get it. Yep. It's gonna happen. Mm. You've got that that steel and that determination. I and it, you know, you're only going forward. Mm-hmm. Go get it. So right, now I make documentaries. Um, I tell you what I want to ask. Okay. Um, when you split up with take that, they described that moment as such a fucking weird moment. It was like you were in the room and they were like, "Yeah, we've been um, thinking about doing the next two hours of four. and you're like, "All right then." And apparently, you didn't even like get angry or anything. And you're like, and you're like. Guess I'll be off then. And and there was a bit of melon on. Apparently, there's melon on the side of the room. And you went, and you were just about to go out the door. And you went, I'll just get that melon. And can I? Take, and then you could, can I take this? Is <laughs> that all right? And then yeah, and then I walked off the, the rehearsal rooms to the sound of my own feet. And I was like, I'm going through the door, and I'm uh, I'm taking this melon. Uh, bye then, lads. And that was it. No, no, and, you actually stick your head back and went. Definitely going. Definitely going. Yeah, for, <laughs> just for comedic effect, jump back in and went. It was such a I'm like... going. And, and then, uh, so what was happening was I was dreadfully unhappy, uh, dreadfully, dreadfully unhappy with how I was being treated, and also I'd sort of got a raging alcohol problem running alongside of that. It's a heady mix. They said that they had no idea how bad it was. Like you hid it from them. Because we would have all assumed that I didn't exactly. No, I did. I didn't exactly hide it, but it was. It was very. It was very. It seemed very normal. Uh-huh. You're a young lad. You go get drunk. They didn't see what was happening when I go back to the hotel room and but there you was carry on. on. Uh-huh. Yeah, they didn't see that. So I wasn't really hiding it from anybody per se. Um, so anyway, I'd said to the lads after this tour, I'm going to leave the band, but we were rehearsing, and as you know take that at the time did lots of dancing and uh, choreography was never my big strong point and learning routines has never been my big strong point and me being drunk every night didn't mix with the uh, intense focus that was needed to put together a tour so um, I was letting the side down and the lads had a meeting without me and could see that this was a problem and said look I I think he should go now uh, before the before the tour starts to prove that we can do this as a four piece and I came in and I rehearsed as usual lackadaisically and um, that afternoon How did that moment feel though? You must have been pretty upset There, It felt, felt very strange it felt like a release like I'd been relieved of the pressure that I was feeling but also there was uh, I was terrified about what the future would hold in that moment I got in a car, 
with my Malin, drove back to Stoke on Trent. With a face on it. You with a face Wilson. on Wilson. Sad face. Wilson. Yeah, my new best friend. <laughs> yeah. We'll form a, a group together. <laughs> yeah. And so Didn't I'm, you go to Glassdoor or something after that? No, 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 I was didn't. That... I went home and my mum was moving into this new place and uh, she was shifting stuff in. And I looked up into the loft and I said, you're never going to believe this. I've been sacked. And she's like, oh, no, you don't know how much trouble you're in. You're going to, there's so much stuff to do with lawyers. It's going to be such a hassle. There's mm-hmm. going to be press and da, da, da. And I was like, uh, I felt a bit beat up by it. I brought you know, melon home. Yeah, I brought, well, I've got this melon with a face on it. <laughs> I, you know, I kind of wanted a cuddle. And I was, you know, this is how I remember it. It might have been different. But I was like, oh, uh, okay, so I'm in trouble there. Now I'm in trouble here. And then I got a phone call from a friend of mine that's a record producer and he was friends with the great and good. And uh, he said, we're going to um, Saint-Tropez this Friday. And I'm like, Stoke, Saint-Tropez, I'll go to Saint-Tropez. Similar. So there I was with Dodie Al-Fayed, wow. Kate Moss, Al McPherson, Naomi Campbell, um, Duran Duran. Uh, was anyone famous there? No, there was nobody famous there, <laughs> okay. which was unfortunate because that's what I was into at the time. Yeah. Michael Hutchins was there with wow. Paulie Yates. And uh, I had a wild time. None of us could sleep. I don't know what it was, but none of us could get Something to sleep. In the water. Anyway, so I'd been there for like a couple of days and I'm around the swimming pool with Michael Hutchins and the phone goes by the pool and I, I, I see Michael Hutchins pick it up and he's like, oh, you can hear the other end, just, and Michael Hutchins goes, Robbie, it's, uh, it's your mum. <laughs> so Michael Hutchins passes me the phone, and my mum's like, right, it's gone to the sun, you're in trouble, it's going to be on the front page, you need to come home now. And I'm like, oh, okay, I'm going to come home now. So I'm surrounded by the great of good, being berated by my mum. And I was like, sorry, guys, I've got to go home. <laughs> mum says I've got to come in now. <laughs> So and then I, I flew back to Stoke on Trent, and uh, the uh, ensuing publicity surrounding my departure happened, and I hid out in a house in Wimslow for about two months, just be, be confined to barracks, and just stayed in this house and hid away. Did I've you? seen um, you know the girls, the reaction when you left, where yeah. the, you were in the streets flailing around, and like when they were in the streets flailing around. The girls, yeah. oh yeah, the girls went crazy. Like, what, what, what's that like? Do you, are you sort of looking at them thinking, "Fucking get a hold of yourself, will you?" Oh, um, fucking hell! Well, there was, there was um, taking it worse than me. There was, ha- there was how plans set up for you know in Germany because no, yeah. I, I think people, somebody tragically committed Oops. suicide at the time. But I was just so deep into vodka and my own thoughts that I didn't even consider what was going on outside. Can there's there's a few questions that arise from that is one is why uh what who put that publicity out? Like why was it on the front page of the sun? Do you know who did that? Yes and, I do know who did that. And do you slightly resent the way that it happened? I resent them. Was that the manager again, was it? No. No. No it wasn't. It was somebody that I was at the party with decided that in, in their infinite wisdom at half past six in the morning after both of us having a row hypnol to phone the then head of the showbiz column in the sun and tell him that uh, I'd left take that so another and celebrity I, I, we, yeah kind of yeah and I desperately didn't want him to do that but he was like a peer of mine and somebody that I was kind of beholden to and looked up to and I'm a dramatic people pleaser too, so mm. I knew that this was the worst thing that he could do for me. Uh, and why did he have the telephone number to the showbiz editor at half past six in the morning from anyway? From the sun as well. From the sun, yeah. After a roofie. After, yeah, after a roofie. And, um, and so it was, but I, I can't change that now. But yeah, at the time, that was a difficult one to swallow, the roofie. <laughs> And then because I got cotton mouth. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but then also when you go there, is everyone relaxed there? Oh, yeah, like, all... no, you know what I mean by this. Like, so obviously we see the public side of Naomi Campbell. We see the public side of all those people that you listed. Is it a very different environment when it is just you guys going away together? Like, is that a side that we wouldn't necessarily see of all those celebrities? And the same for you. And then the follow up question to that is: Would they then know that you had an alcohol problem? Um, it was the 90s 
Everyone had an alcohol problem. Everybody had an alcohol problem. And a cocaine And problem. a cocaine problem. And maybe they did or maybe they didn't. You know, some people's got out of hand and some people's didn't. I'm surrounded by a lot of people that can handle their drugs. Right. You know, I'm not talking about my wife, but my, you know, there's a lot of people that I know. Why did you just do that to me, though? Is this yeah. yeah. There's a lot of people that I know that aren't like me. Not every, yeah. you know, it's like, what is it, 5% of the population or maybe more, I don't know, will have a drink and drug problem. Yeah. I'm one of the 5%. It doesn't necessarily mean that everybody that took cocaine needs to go to Alcoholics Anonymous or uh, Narcotics Anonymous or goes to rehab. You know, some people are going to get burnt. I got burnt. So did you feel relaxed in that environment, though? Among the celebs. Among the celebs. I've get- seen you when you met David Beckham, right? And I was watching... That's when I first knew we were going to get you on. I just started watching a few clips here. And I could tell you felt awkward as fuck meeting David oh, Beckham. Oh, yeah. He was there having a birthday party with Posh and all that, and he had his long blonde hair and a ponytail at the back. And I could tell Beautiful. you, thought, I could see it. It was written all over your body language of, this is fucking ridiculous, isn't it? It was so over the top and all that for a... Yeah, but, that. but I don't know if it was so me, me kind of judging the ridiculous No, no, I just I could, I could but tell that, you but, were but uncomfortable. That, but that's me. That's how I am when I meet people, uh-huh. you know? And especially, mm-hmm. I don't know, Dave is sort of uh, is unique as well you know there's an oh, mm. there's an aura that follows him around and then but all of a sudden you're in but I, I could why though I could you be, though yeah but I could be like that with a third division footballer right yeah. you know it's like whoever that is uh-huh. guy that plays for Mansfield you play for Mansfield do you yeah. yeah what position yeah how many games have you played uh-huh. oh you, you, you play at the but back but because it's Beckham it's it's oh yeah, but even, so. but even with David, but with you, David Beckham, it's even more multiplied. You've right. met him before this, obviously. With, with you, you should be comfortable at that point. So, is this more down to what you were talking about to me about the agoraphobia and stuff like that? It's just generally Ag- agoraphobia and social awkwardness, mm-hmm. and you know, because I also fill gaps where you know with stuff that I don't really. I'm grabbing at things. It's a bar fight again, and mm-hmm. I just like fill a gap with something that I've just said that I don't mean at all. Like, I mean the opposite of what I've just said, but now I can't back out of that and explain to you what's going on in my head. Um, yeah, I'm I'm awkward. I feel awkward. I'd like it to be different. Yeah, and d- with David Beckham, it's you know it's like I, I saw him, I saw him uh, like seven seven weeks ago in Los Angeles. He was on the beach. I'm like. All right, mate. And then I think of all the things that I can say to him, and I try to get into conversation. And I'm like, "Love you." Got to back out now. <laughs> and I back away. I sort of like on without it. breaking vision. Yeah. Just this is so weird. See you, Dave. And then walk out backwards. Yeah. Like no, but that. you're. Why was he not wearing any pants? I find this pants? really hard to understand because it's like you've been around these people for years. You should be like you know it's all bullshit. At this you've point. also earned your place at the table at this yeah, point. Yeah, you're, well, you're, you're, you're solidified as. Uh, one of the most famous people in this country is like and I know you're saying I'm a fan though I'm a fan yeah. Yeah, you know a fan. I'm a fan I'm a fan of your podcast oh. which is like when when you two walk in I'm like I've just seen you all summer <laughs> how amazing is that and you know still still as this podcast goes on it's dissipating but it might come back up where I'm like oh yeah I remember when you said about your dad <laughs> when you said about them women that you shagged yeah. Yeah. oh well, you years know etc uh, etc et so I, I'm, I'm still a fan I'm still a human I, I still take in television the way that other people take in TV. I still watch films the but, way other people watch films. Is that not like slightly a part of the... It's, must, it's so weird having to analyse yourself like this, like you're beginning some sort of uh, therapy. It is a bit weird. But, um, is it, it, it's, I think it's a very natural reaction to the way that celebrity is. And a lot of people are very good at just playing it off. So that list of people that you had were incredible people at just playing the celebrity game. And it seems that actually... A lot of the things that seem like shortcuts, which are being, you know, extremely gregarious, but in just the right amount, is not where your strength lies. But your strengths are elsewhere, and that's why you're in that circle. So you're not a typical celebrity. I don't know what a typical celebrity is. Or what people, maybe the archetypal celebrity, what people create this vision in their mind of how a celebrity should act. You don't act necessarily in that way. Uh... But that's not a conscious thing. Not many, not many yeah. things seem extremely conscious. They come across as super confident I, I, I socialites. Don't. Super. You don't. Yeah, but do they? Oh, I. Who does? Well, generally, when you watch it, like Campbell. for example, you come across that way on Graham Norton when you're getting up and you meet Nelton John and you. 
really? doing all of that. And you look like you're being doing it. Yeah, yeah but I can. Do you I feel can, comfortable around him though? You must because around you talk, out. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I pretty much do. He's still out. How with do John. you know when to double kiss though? This is. I was watching. I think when you're meeting a queen. But yeah. how yeah. do you know when to double kiss? Because with Elton, I'm not sure if I'm going in for a handshake, a hug, a double kiss. What, what, well, in I, case I, I have an interview. It's showbiz, in it, love? Yeah. So, you know, and I also know Elton from back in the day. Yeah. You know. The crime and, scene. Yeah, the, gr- the grind <laughs> scene. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so mm. back when it was Reg, though, innit? Mm. Yeah. But, so the, what you're saying is you've picked up Mr. on those Dwight. habits of how to act in celebrity circles. No, you... But then you're also saying, but still you struggle, even even. Yeah, so. no, you... Well, I'm for, like, Graham Norton. Mm. I can be shitting myself about Graham Norton yeah. for four weeks before it. So I put work into Graham Norton. I know oh. exactly what I'm going to say. There's a bit in the book about that as well, isn't yeah, there? I know, yeah, I know exactly what I'm going to say. I know what stories I'm going to do, and hopefully these stories will be entertaining and they'll hit home, and I can be gregarious, yeah. hopefully charming, if not funny. We've been told not to follow up on one of those stories. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. About someone in a bag. Yeah, yeah. Oh I'm right, yeah. To say, yeah. I'll, <laughs> Can't I'll follow up. Being on told that. off on that. Yeah. No, I'll, I'll tell you why afterwards. Yeah. So um, yeah, but I can do an imp- I can do an impression of some. I, I want to make good TV. Yeah. You want to make good content, you know, and you do, you know. It's like I'm the same on television. I want a what's he going to do next moment. Mm-hmm. I want to be entertaining. I, I feel as though it's my duty, and sometimes mm-hmm. I get it right, and sometimes I get it wrong, and sometimes I get into trouble with mm-hmm. people. Like the time when you told the story of um, the cleaner. Yeah. yeah. Was that a similar moment to where you're like, I need to fill this gap? What story was that? No. Here's a story. Do you know the cleaner story? No, no. Oh, I'll tell you the cleaner story. Okay, so no, it's not. So right. I, I know that I've amassed together quite a lot of stories. I'm 43. Good. Quite Great a lot stories. Of, quite a lot of interesting things have happened to me. Yeah. And Good. I wouldn't mind putting together a kind of one-man show maybe starting at the Edinburgh Fringe or something mm-hmm. and I just tell my story. Oh, Tyson does that. Yes, mm-hmm. exactly. So um, I was, uh, with this in mind, I went on Graham Norton and I thought, right, okay, so I've got the ability to tell these stories, they translate well, they seem to go down well. Okay, well, if I'm going to do this one-man show uh, to, uh, in the future... I'll, I'll come out fighting. I told this story about this time that I was renting a castle in... Uh, Who rents a castle? Yeah, I was, I was renting a castle somewhere. I won't give it out where it was. Mm-hmm. And it had this enormous room in it, which was my bedroom at the time. And I went to sleep and I woke up. And you know, as it is when you wake up, you're not fully awake and they're the most relaxing times where you sort of like you don't really know where you are and I'm sort of in and out of consciousness and I'm like it's that's weird it feels as though somebody's uh, got a feather duster and they're cleaning the room but I'm, I'm gone nobody should be in my room how did they get in my room and why are they cleaning with a feather duster and I opened my eyes and there was a lady there of indescribable age she could have been anywhere from between 32 to 62 I'm not quite sure and she had on this headset uh, with a Walkman and it was a tape cassette we were well into CDs by this time Mm -hmm. and she had sellotape wrapped around one of her headphones and she was using this feather duster like this to clean my bedroom and I look at her and she looks at me and she says "Uh, have you got morning glory? And I went, oh no, first of all, she went, she looked at my underpants on the floor and she went, Kelvin Klein's? And I went, yeah. <laughs> and she went, and so she funny. went, she went, pussy. <laughs> like, right. Ugh. She said, you got morning glory? And I went, yeah. She went, I'll wank you off. And I went, oh, I'm good with my imagination. Go on then. Oh my god! So she does the deed. She does. I, I wish that would happen to me. Something. She does. She does the deed. I close my eyes. I think mm. of England. We haven't um, got a cleaner for the house yet. That reminds us. We do actually. Anyway, she's just so come and off there. she goes, mm. and that's the uh, that's the experience that I had that morning, uh-huh. that evening. I'm with the lady that is in charge of the house, and I said, Do you know, the lady that came into my bedroom <laughs> to clean my bedroom this morning, she's a bit strange, and she said. We don't have cleaners in the room, so. <laughs> so, <laughs> so a stranger 
had walked in, prepared <laughs> with a feather duster, <laughs> she broke into the house <laughs> and came upstairs and did the deed and left. Because she was a fan of you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll tell you what. And then yeah, I'll tell you what, that's then, amazing. Yeah, but then I'm telling this story to my band years later. I'm telling this story to my band like 15 <laughs> years later. And my mate in the band goes... Maureen from the pub. <coughs> she said she did that, but nobody believed her. <laughs> so Maureen from the pub's obviously been telling people, have you got a bit of an injury? No. Just, is it, is it, is it uh, the electricity between us? I don't know, mate. I don't know what's happening, but fucking hell. So that, was my, mint, that. that was my Maureen from the I've pub actually, story. I've actually got a bit of a fantasy about um, a cleaner. Oh, right. Okay. Um, I thought you were going to say him. Right. Hotel cleaner in particular, because I do. I used to do loads of hotels. Right. And um, I got a bit into clean up on. Yeah, somebody said to me the way to uh, differentiate between what's weird and not is fantasizing about shagging the maid mm -hmm. is not weird. Right. Mm -hmm. Shagging the maid is weird. Mm. That's what I've been told. Yeah. I don't know where you sit on that. I mean, I definitely <laughs> you would sit on that. That's yeah. what she said. If, if the opportunity arises, I'll, I'll be good. Go no on. matter the age? The thing, I think you, you because it's so, no, you. Uh, the idea that it's random and it's sort of just happening. At, that way, I would like that. It's I quite would, driven by sort yeah, of animal I would, I would instincts. Like Especially if it was because it, I would like it more if it was because she was a fan as well. That would actually do it for me more. Right. Going back to the social weirdness thing, what I have been doing is employing a tactic just recently. It's like if I'm at a restaurant or whatever and I'm with a group of people that I've mm -hmm. never met before, I actually think about you guys. This is, I know this is weird. Okay. But I actually think I'm doing a podcast. Brilliant. And I've got to keep the conversation going. Mm -hmm. So far, that's that tactic that I've employed has worked for me. That's mm -hmm. weird, because yeah. one of my mates just told us, he's a car salesman, right? and he always thinks when he's talking to someone, he has to be like confident, and he goes, I just think, how would you act? Right. And uh, What would Brian do? Uh, basically, is his sort of, and oh, he's, apparently it's working well for him. So. See, I, I, guess I don't bump into many people that have got the same sort of thing as me. I don't meet many people that go, actually, I feel the same way, that mm. if I'm in a social ah. situation that I get drained because I, I, I'll just be completely drained and then I'll go home and switch the TV on and I'll be sort of uh, Is that because you're performing within the within the chat? Yeah uh -huh. Yeah well I, I'm trying to appear normal <laughs> <laughs> trying to appear normal and interested and quite often I am very Well you live up to the hype as well huh? Do you feel like you have to live up to this Robbie Williams character? No nah, No nah, I, I just want to I just want to succeed. I just want to beat this thing that I've got that seems to I find overwhelming. There's a story in my hometown that you walked into a local Indian restaurant and bought everyone a meal. Didn't happen, but I'll take it. Fair enough. I'll take right. the story. That's quite upsetting then, because a lot of people tell that story whenever people go to this restaurant. We now know it was fucking bullshit. We now know it was bullshit, and it's not even the best. In, yeah. Uh, um, there's like a high street. Didn't happen. Yeah. It didn't happen. Yeah. yeah. Manzil's better anyway, so. Any Newcastle stories? Yes, yeah. I really? do. I've really? got a Newcastle story. Come in. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, the, the, okay. Maureen appeared but again. It, you might know this story, so don't don't trip over the punchline. No. It's a Bobby Robson story. All right. All right. So Bobby Robson is doing a uh, book signing, and a fella comes up to him and is like, "Forgive me for doing the accent." He's like, "I, I, I Bobby, uh, you've." Uh, You've been here for ages, but you've 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 signed a Lord, right? It's good, isn't it? Is that not? That's decent? pretty decent. Okay, you've, you've signed it's, be a, it's better than Lawrence's, which is more like Jamaican. Right, you've signed a Lord, right? And Bobby goes, "I son, hundreds. I've signed hundreds." And he gets it and he writes it down and gives him the book. Guy's on his way home and he's on the bus and he opens it and it says, "To Timmy, love Bobby hundreds." <laughs> <laughs> Because like Bobby Robson was, uh, oh, he was getting on a bit. Yeah, and he was music, like yeah. famous for his. He used to call all the players by like uh, the wrong names yeah. and stuff like that. Uh, bless Which him. also got was tactics, it, though. Joe Kinnear did that as well. Amamobi and Johan Kebab. Yeah, um, Johan Kebab. That was the that, that went down the, really well. The Joe Kinnear yeah. one, yeah. Unlike bless, bless him. Him. So uh, Newcastle is for sale. Do you yeah, want it? Hey, Not fancy buying with. Yeah. Well. If anything, Somebody has to. if anything happens, it sort of has to be in a Port Vale kind of direction. Yeah. But I, but which direction? I, uh, we're you know buying Port Vale and uh, but I, I don't live in this country very often. Mm. LA based, aren't you? LA based. But I, I'm kind of find myself in a position where you kind of like, well, can I put my foot down on this thing? What what happens if I just make it go fast? And mm. I'm like, can I uh, can I buy a football club? And and my people are like, yeah, why not? 
And you know, what's it like having people? Because I'm looking forward. To I want people. If we can have, um, can I have people? Yeah, you've got some people. I've, we've got, I've got some people, but I want more people to sort sometimes of. You, to, you, okay, sometimes you, sometimes you treat your equals me. as they, if they are your people. Right? I do. Yeah. Well, you, Text me the day of most days we do the weekend show, and he goes, "Can I have a full English breakfast when I arrive, please?" And I'm like, "What to you?" Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Great. I'm just setting everything up so that when I do... Just ask the question, is there always a full English breakfast there when you ask for yeah, one? Yeah. Every time, there we wow. go. Even so you are the people. One. But he's... he's a, the thing is with Lawrence, he does a lot, don't you, mate? Lawrence is sort of stuff. creative front, in front of the camera, bit of everything, do you know what I mean? Anyway, so I've just found out all the clubs that are for sale. Mm -hmm. Is there like a record of that? Yeah, there kind of is. Yeah. You, you get like a list through of hits that you can basically, do you want to go for this? Do you want to go for this? Yeah. What do you want to go for? Yeah. I, I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to do it because if I should be doing it, anything, it should be with Port Vale. Mm -hmm. But also, you know, it's like people are not going to take nicely to me buying Newcastle, are they? If I could be like sort of um, director of football, maybe we I could would make take, it work. I would take I like you that with me well. if that work. happened. Or head of social, at least, because I, mean, I, I mean, Jesus. I mean, I think, isn't like Newcastle's every, everybody's second favourite Pretty much. Side. Uh, everybody's fond of Newcastle. Bring so back Kevin I. Keegan. I'm not going. I'm not going to do it because it'd be an absolute nightmare, and people would hate me. Mm. But there is a bit of me that goes, I could do that. I could manage I could, that club. That's how mental my life is. Yeah, you know. And at some point, yeah. I had that moment know. of the day actually. Oh really? I was, I was on here? the way there, and I, I just text someone saying, "Robbie Williams, chef's currently making my lunch." Mm -hmm. Just um. How, rate, rate your lunch we, we're very healthy it was here. really good so good oh, okay, I was, cool. I, I'd be in great shape if I had the, um, the young lady um, the chef yeah that's what I, that's what I'm doing I'm doing yeah. uh, you've got no excuses with that I'm doing plant based mm. stuff what does that mean why have, you, why have you moved towards that why have I moved towards that because I suppose I got really ill this year mm. and I watched a documentary called What the Health yeah. Have you seen it? Everyone's no, seen no. that. It's a good, it's have a good you, doc. Yeah, I yeah. avoid um, anything sort of vegan or uh, food based because it, yeah, it makes you not want to eat what you like. Well, I, I'm also aware just before the internet jumps in and batters me over the head with the debunking of, of what the health, I'm also aware of that too. But it kind of made sense to me. Mm -hmm. It's like, show me how, um, you know, meat was processed, the... Um, the way that they're looked after or not looked after, the hormones, the steroids, the da 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 da, da and I'm like, well, uh, yeah, I get that. Mm. And then if I eat this, it's more healthy for you. Yeah. And this year, more than ever, I've just needed to give myself a little bit of space with looking after myself. So I've started to be plant-based. I'm not vegan. I said, I erroneously said vegan on an Instagram thing that I did and the internet jumped down my throat because yeah. I'm not a vegan. I got the terminology wrong. Sorry, guys. <laughs> that steak but, I had today was bloody lovely. Yeah, well, I, I'm, still, I'm still at the Stamp weekends. Fingers. You know, I'm, I dabble at the weekend. You dabble, yeah. <laughs> just a different type of dabbling. But, but I, I feel better, yeah. I, and I don't mean I, I feel superior because I'm 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 not uh, adding to the killing of animals. I just feel better because they're going to die feel, anyway. I feel right? lighter. They're going to yeah. die anyway. Well, what yeah. a brilliant response! They're yeah. going to die anyway. Doesn't matter if you don't eat them. Shut up! Die. Someone else will eat them if you don't. Well, well, not, so, even if they don't eat them, they are, are you, all going to die. To eat, I mean, you are you allowed human, to eat then the ones that just died? Maybe. Yes, yeah. technically, yeah. it'd be Perhaps better. we should start a farm. Old age. These have just died. Well, like pensioners, where yeah. we're sort of giving them sponge baths. Yeah. <laughs> Cold. Would you like a cup of tea and a crumpet? Yeah. Just to be clear, you don't have to give a pensioner. First of all, cows can't collect a pension. Second of all, it would be unusual to sponge bath a cow. You always jump in and spoil things. Mm. It's, um, all I'm saying is, let's avoid the sponge bath. Why are you sponge bathing a cow? I'm just saying just... that's what pensioners generally get. Right. Even the cow ones. I tell you what, I bet your cow would bloody love a sponge. Who doesn't love a sponge bath? Sure, are you a saying you would... would love a sponge bath, mate? Anyone sure. loves a sponge Paul McCartney bath. loves a sponge bath. Um, so I'm told. Yeah. Um, yeah, expensive. Yeah. So when you... Have you met Paul McCartney? Is there anyone you haven't met? Yes, met I, lot, you? yes I have. Have you Which met all the living Beatles? Were you more starstruck well, when well, you met? Well, with Paul McCartney, my self-hatred was so bad. We were doing the same TV show. Uh, this was, I, I, I think, like 97 or something. And it was a reboot of an old TV show called The Tube. Have you heard of The Tube? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It was like late 70s, early 80s, and they were rebooting it. And I was supposed to be getting up to sing with Paul McCartney. Wow. And, Which song? Uh, probably Hey Jude or something mm -hmm. like that to end the show. And I just thought to myself, because it was really bad, that man, that legend shouldn't be on stage with me 
and he just doesn't know that he shouldn't be on stage with me. Right. I'm going to put him out of his misery and not sing. <laughs> Bang. So I I left the uh, but I think I thought I'd left a note saying hey Paul great but I'm not going to do that but I just thought he shouldn't be on stage with me shouldn't appear yeah. with me it was that bad sad really thinking that way anyway he introduced me on stage and since then I think he <coughs> he was thinking that I dissed him wait but, so he introduced you and then you didn't come out yes. Oh, so it looks more like he was really trolling the crowd. Yeah, maybe. ladies and gentlemen, um, Mr. Robbie, Robbie Williams. Williams. But but since then, I think he's a bit suspicious of me. Yeah. Maybe yeah, wrongly. But let's hope he hears the story. And... Yeah, Paul, I didn't mean it. Sorry, I really Paul. hated myself, and I wanted to sing with you. I just thought you shouldn't do because you didn't know who I was. Yeah. Do you think he could have done justice to let me entertain you or not? I let me entertain you. That's actually really good. Yeah, yeah. Hell is gone and heaven's here. There's nothing left for you to fear. Shake your ass, come over here now. See, woo. Thank you. Have you done that before? Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, so, who have you been starstruck by? I mean, Paul McCartney. You met Paul McCartney though, or I met not? Paul McCartney before met him at, Yeah, I, well, I, I didn't. I Drop didn't. a diss track. That would that would really help. Bang. Paul That'd McCartney. be so yeah. good. Fuck Paul McCartney by Robbie Williams. Can yeah. you remember when uh, 50 Cent did his, the, was it The Art of Robin? Yeah, that How to Rob, I think. How to Rob. He did, he did every single big rapper on one track and basically said how he was going to rob them all. Yeah, I, I think the time has yeah. gone for me, but yeah. that was something that I could have done in the late 90s. Who did that? Uh, I think it was... Um, Kendrick did it. Kendrick did something more. similar, mm, but it wasn't quite as good as... They say there's an M there's the record where it's uh, Drake, Eminem, Andre 3000, and Kanye West and all those, and uh, Eminem's the last verse, and apparently all the verses are like, laced with disses of yeah. the other uh, people on that track. They, uh, who have been... Uh, overwhelmed with Alton, you know, oh, yeah. so, like like uh, the first time hanging around with him, we were at Johnny Versace's um, house on Lake Como in Italy, and we just arrived at this huge mansion on a lake. And there even was, just hearing about it's blown my mind. We, yeah, it blew my mind. <laughs> and there was like a, a, a cavalcade of just the most chic black cars. Yeah. You know, do you the, know how you're talking about that though? Yeah. When I come into this house, that's how I feel in, oh, really? in this house. Like I'm walking around. I'm it's like, a lovely house. Oh, oh, the kitchen's bigger much. than my entire flat. No. No. Well, I, it, I, I, I can vouch for it. I've seen it on Skype. He's so, never invited us around. So yet. anyway, I'm with you know Johnny Versace oh. and Donatella Versace and jo Johnny Johnny Versace is coming up going. You are my favourite one. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm, I'm Johnny's favourite. Yeah, Take that. Yeah, Great. Yeah. Johnny's favourite. Can I have some jeans? And um, yeah. so me and... <laughs> oh, that's actually cheese. literal, by the way. He's asking for cheese. Yeah. yeah. No, jeans. Oh, jeans. Yeah, jeans. Massage of jeans. I knew he thought cheese. Yeah. <laughs> I thought he said cheese. cheese yeah. please. Yeah. <laughs> so oh, you did really great cheese up there. Yeah. So then I, I walk out and it's just me and Alton John. And we're just shooting the shit. Yeah. What did and you talk then, about? Uh, I, did he also when you meet each other? Do you know? Do you sort of go, "It's me, Robbie," or do you go, "Obviously, we not, 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 not at that time," because I was like eighteen-year-old Robbie, and right. we're just shooting the shit, and we're walking around this garden that overlooks this beautiful lake, and at one point, it just like a Matrix moment where it just goes. Mm -hmm. You're with Elton John, and I went, "You're Elton John," mm -hmm. out of the middle of nowhere. It yeah. was like we were just shooting the shit. Then all of a sudden, I just went, "You're out and John," and he was like, "Yeah, yeah." It must have been the biggest dickhead moment of his day. But uh, yes, of course, I have. I kind of have those moments all the time. But that was like an overwhelming thing. Yeah. Situations that you find yourself being. How, in. What's he like? Just for, in small talk. What What does he talk about? I mean, he likes football, doesn't he? He, he, was he owns Watford, Watford, yeah. Watford owner. Yeah, he likes football. He also lo loves music. Um, and, you know... Great writer. He's, no shit. he's an incredible writer. And you sort of talk about things that are going on in your life. You talk about family. You talk about relationships that you have. And you talk about uh, things that are going on in your career and where you find yourself. Yeah. Because he was in that moment mm. of 20 years ago in the similar sort of moment. So... You never They're just people, aren't they? Celebrities. That's what that's what I'm starting to learn. They're just well, people. Yeah. All of them. Uh, yeah. Even Kanye. Yeah. Even as crazy as Kanye. Have just you met person. Kanye West? That'd be interesting. Yes, I have met Kanye yeah. West and Kim. And really? Yeah. yeah. And he came to. What's Kim's ass like in person? It's big, big ass. Really? Yeah, it's a big ass. Big, lo big, lovely ass. Relatively. And he just said, just I'm, I'm a big like. fan of your work, which was very sweet. Did he? That, yeah. yeah, that was it. I, 
He might have got me mixed up with somebody I else. Doubt it. He uh, has Rob, a, he Robin like, Williams. We, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I get that all the what time. Was you? You were great and missed out for. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I haven't heard that Fuck off. a Someone. million times. Yeah, no, no. yeah so uh, yeah, Not Jumanji, met, met Kanye. When I think of Elton, though, one thing that comes to me head. But here's the, here's oh, the thing. Let me get back to this though. Is the um, yeah celebrities and them just being normal? Yeah. Because I I always ask. Well, a lot of the time I ask, who's the biggest dickhead that you've met? All right. Yeah. So who is the biggest dickhead that you've Tim met? Tim Roth. Anyway, Never so heard uh, had it so prepared. Who's he again? Uh, I think he owns Blackburn. Uh, yeah, no. So I'll oh. tell you about Tim Roth in a minute. But what the the amazing the thing, thing is, the dickheads really stand out. Right. You know, right. it's not the kind of it's not the. Um, what do you mean by stand out in a good way? Well, you no. could, because you think that celebrities before you become one and become ingratiated and know the great and good. You think that they're going to have an ego, they're going to be pompous, or there's going to be an edge to them. And I'm pleased to announce that um, most most people, 98% of yeah. people that I've ever met, have been lovely and charming and affable and nice. But the ones that aren't stick out. And right. Tim Roth was a dickhead. What is he famous for? He was in a, a lot, by the way. he was in a film uh, Reservoir Dogs. Oh back in the day and he was also in Pulp Fiction yeah. and we were just at a bar and he sticks out as being the, the top what of did he do thing. though to make you feel such a bad first impression Take okay care. so I was a big fan of Reservoir Dogs and a big fan All of right. Pulp Fiction and uh, there was Tim Roth so he's a bit of a hero isn't he's that, a right? hero you never met your heroes yeah he's a, he's a hero I think you're doing really well today. Thanks. Yeah, no, he's a he. He was a hero. He's just done a Prada campaign, and he looked great in the Prada campaign. And he was, the, and I love those films. Uh -huh. So I was kind of like touching the forelock, meeting him. I don't know if I should be telling this story. Ah, uh, fuck it. Ah, uh, fuck it. Fuck him. So um, <laughs> we're at the Groucho Club, and I go up We've to all him, been. and I <coughs> said, um, uh, Mr. Roth, it's a pleasure to meet you. Um, but what, love your films. So you've just done the Prada campaign. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. He's like, who are you? And I went, uh, my name's Rob, Robbie. What do you do? I'm in a, a band. Uh, I was in a band called Take That. I'm not, oh yeah, I've heard of them. Really dismissive, incredibly dismissive. And then was dismissive of the whole room. I was playing snooker with... Uh, uh, what's his name Keith Allen and mm -hmm. Stephen Fry yeah. and it was like really just like wow this is I've never experienced this before he goes over to speak to my girlfriend at the time and um, he turned to me and he said how did you get a girlfriend like this and I uh, undid my pull cue went over to him put it up to his face and I said uh, I know how it feels to be insecure I'm really insecure myself but the next words that come out of your mouth better be fucking nice. I'm going to wrap this fucking porky around your head. <laughs> and he left. So that's my Tim Roth story. And then Who's the Reservoir the music, music, Dogs music started yeah. playing bom, and you bom, were back. Yeah, yeah. Good, good decision bom, maker, bom, bom, Tim Roth. Yeah. Good decision maker, at the very least. So, yeah, so there, was, <laughs> the, there is a resentment that's lasted. Uh, that, is that in the book, Chris? Not in this one. It Not, is now. It's in the next one. Right, yeah. In the next one. Uh, Elton John. It, it, have you met a celebrity that's pissed you off? I've met a few YouTubers um, that would piss me off. I mean, uh, <coughs> no. I think the thing is with me is what a celebrity or non-celebrity. People are usually a bit like uh, probably want to be nice to that guy. You may fucking uh, hit us or something. Uh, they get this impression about us. So most people are nice to us regardless. A bit standoffish. Have you then? I'm trying to think who I've met that I didn't really like. I've been surprised the other way when people have been overly nice. Yeah. yeah. I'm trying to think of who's been a real asshole. No, no one's an asshole. Uh, Give it time. There was a there was someone from the Only Way Is Essex who was really funny, who thought everyone watched the show, and then he was talking to me as if I knew who these people were, and he I, was like, "We didn't have them on or anything." No, no, Mark. No, it was the uh, Arj. Because I love Mark. It oh, oh, sure, bless him. Yeah, and yeah. I felt I felt a little bit sorry for him because he went. You know, I've been hanging out with Mark, and I went, so, "Sorry, who's, who's Mark? Mark?" And I was yeah. just a runner, yeah. <laughs> and I went, oh, "Sorry, who's Mark?" And he went, "Mark." Yeah, yeah, Mark Wright from the show. Yeah, from the show. I love Arj. So uh, he bless seems like him. a lovely. I felt really sorry for him. Do you know? What I mean? So he, he wasn't Apple an asshole. Nice he just didn't know what he was doing. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Um, well, yeah, because uh, Blue you, seemed nice. You, um, you both often talk about like loose women. Mm -hmm. Loose women really pissed me off, and I was a little bit Soft upset. Went on. 
Yeah, we we we, we lash out. It basically, um, it we, shows that we feel like we should be getting their budgets. Yeah, I mean, it's incredible. To, it's incredible and entertaining to watch. Mm-hmm. But I, I and I always think, right, yeah, stick it to whoever you want to stick. Well, it's it a bit to. of jealousy, but, really. But, yeah, exactly. That's but all then it is. I'm also watching, going, oh, wait till you find out that these are all just people, mm-hmm. and they're just people that are doing they're, their job. For me, particularly with soccer, M, I look at soccer M and I think they're just. Um, they're just casualties in the war, like, they, they, and it's and it's just necessary. Here's how much you influence me, PTSD. right? Mm-hmm. This, I told you this before the podcast. Here's how much you influence me. Soccer AM used to be my favourite TV show, <laughs> and uh, were you in with some of that crowd because they were like really nah. cool at that time? He right? was a bit big boy for them. Maybe. Did, no, do you I think was... they thought they were in with you? Yeah. Huh? Do you think they thought they were in with you? There was that like soccer A time when it was like we were no all... soccer AM, not soccer AM. No, I know, but there was so- that time. no soccer AM, no. I th- I no, I didn't hang out with them, but it was my favourite TV show. Right. Yeah. Anyway, so it has declined, but it's still held its ground. But when you were sort of like slagging it off, I was like, yeah, I'm not going to watch that anymore. <laughs> so I haven't watched Soccer AM again. <laughs> truth is truth. Until last night, Ugh. when I put it on and it was like the best bits of the week, and I'm like, hang on, this has still got some legs. No, it hasn't, mate. The thing is, is it dying? The, the reason it is where it is is because it's the only fucking show that Sky... Up- like, if, if you had on Sky One a show made by all those fucking has-beens, no offence, I mean, they're probably lovely people, but has-beens. And on, and on Sky and then on Sports, Sky Sports 2 had mine and Lawrence's show. With Coral. We would fucking annihilate them. But it's because they're getting all the money and all that. We're annihilating them anyway. We're getting better views than them anyway. I, I think... On my own shit. Beating them on my own channel. I, I think you're right. Lovely I think guys, you would though. annihilate them and mm. I would watch that TV show. They're lovely guys, though, yeah. behind Cheers the scenes. Yeah. Having met them all, they all seem like nice guys. I guess... I, I, it's not. It's nothing personal. This is strictly business. Do you know what I mean? I'm yeah, putting it, them out of business. But in That's our industry, there is that line of, like, that blurred line of... So, in a way, Soccer lines. AM's your Gary Barlow. <laughs> is that what it is? Who is? Soccer AM is, 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 is Brian's... Yeah, I mean, I just want to prove a point in the fact that... written any good songs recently. Um, the the thing is this this channel this this company they're really out of date do you know what I mean and, and one thing in entertainment is you've got to move with the times and, and they haven't done and we are and now what they're trying to do is claw a little bit back by so what's Loose Women done to you? Yeah. Loose Women I think that's more Lawrence's um, issue than mine I'll let you take that one Lawrence because his wife's on there quite a bit yeah I uh, I don't like the <laughs> overall vibe the of Loose the Women voice. Uh, yeah um, <coughs> I think the vibe's a little bit off. It's mm. it, a lot of it is, or uh, to be honest, I'm not watching it in quite a while. Maybe it's different with your wife on it. But when it was back in the day, when it first started, it was much more like, yeah. So my husband's a dickhead. Anyway, here's a guest. Right, right. And I didn't really but like did that. It not, did it not entertain you? So the one bit that I, I've I've been offended by in the past, that I could offended? Bring up, Were you triggered? A little bit. Right. Uh, where one woman basically said, yeah. It's, um, Stop fucking my husband a while ago. And then they literally wheeled the husband out the day after to get his opinion on how it feels to be sexless. And it's like some things like you shouldn't. I felt like the, the man was being completely and utterly Cut. humiliated by his wife saying, I just don't want to fuck him anymore. I you think, know? but the, you I mean, know, the thing that, that I was. was a, the, yeah, I get what you're saying. Mm. But the thing that I'm thinking is like when I was talking about the bar fight, mm. yeah. everybody's in their own little bar fight. And, yeah. you know, she's on Loose Women. She probably isn't thinking things through in mm. front of several million people mm-hmm. that are down the lens. And she's thinking of things that she can pull and talk mm. about. She talked about that. And then her husband got in trouble at work, I think, is what happened. Mm. Probably because he wasn't getting shagged. And then he was yeah, he was mortified and he was embarrassed. And then you, as, you, as you do when you're in that situation, you feel as though you've got to come and have your say. So I reckon he was just coming to have his say, but yeah, it was embarrassing. It does feel a bit like, um, and I'm sure I they would hate have... men a bit on that show as well. And that that's that's one thing that gets it because this is the new generation of women who um, nice they take him. empowerment over the line of hate and men. And I'm all for mm. women being like girl power. That's cool, whatever, right? And if it was the other way around, etc. Et but it, it wouldn't happen the other way around. But that's we, we men all, are empowered. We're, we're sort of held away uh, online. Do you know what I mean? That's what I'm trying to do a little bit, but. Uh, I, I think they take it too far and another thing is they they don't even let you speak I mean your interview, your last interview Speaking on there uh, was an absolute shambles in my opinion because I, I could see going and it's like he's the fucking guest do you, do you, do you get that yeah like any, it, it any, went, I'm a daft cunt who isn't even media trained you're literally talking over you, him the rule number one of an <laughs> interviewer shut up a second yeah. is to let the celebrity fucking talk me yeah. you know what I mean no. and with yeah, that no. said no, I'll let you stop it's just <laughs> no no go on. 
I thought I, I me outside of that show being on it or, or not I just and, and my wife I've always been entertained by it mm. and there's nothing else on at that time mm. in the day and, I'm, quite and I'm, I'm quite literally sit there and have that wash over me and have my judgments no it, it's got its place loose women as opposed to Sutler um, which is, is going by the wayside well, it a it's place. a sinking ship uh, loose women has got its place I don't dispute that Okay, so you're not given the chance to do Soccer AM's rival TV show, but you are given the chance to do Loose Men on the BBC no. or Channel 4. Do you do it? I mean, how much are they paying? Because if it's good money, yes, to be honest with you. Well, they're paying massive well. figures. Yeah, why not then? Uh, why Carl not? can attest. Uh, do, you, do you think there's... Uh, I mean, no, we're, we're far from artistic integrity. Me too. Um, <laughs> but do you do you think there's an element of that to it where a lot of content now feels a bit lowest common denominator and it feels so Soccer AM to me still feels very much like they're still going for the men that they did when Lovejoy was on it Tim Lovejoy not Lee Lovejoy he's yeah, great yeah, yeah. Um, the detective the de was he a detective <laughs> I don't know if he was, was, he was no. an antiques dealer that was, sort of uh, helped with yeah, problems yeah, 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 yeah. yeah it's a great format my <laughs> yeah. dad loves it uh, I think he thinks of himself as a bit of a Lovejoy type. Right, right, you know, right. um, in, again, middle-aged men love watching that show because they're like, I can be that middle-aged man. Right. Do you know what I mean? It's a great show. Uh, and then Loose Women maybe f felt when I watched it when it first came on a bit wrong. I don't know. I, you know, I'm not. I'm you not can't here comment. To, I'm really. not here to come and, and fight the corner for Loose Women. It was more jovial than anything because I know that you you knew that I was coming on for the, the podcast and I was watching one of your podcasts and you were like, and Loose Women and the fuck. Actually, not all of them. Not all of them. Not all of them. And I'm sitting there going, no, not all of them. They're yeah. all dickheads. Yeah, not all no, of them. Like, are. Some, so, some are all right. Can yeah. we just say, Robbie Williams' wife's all right? Yeah, She's yeah. Fine. But I, I was in like a hotel in Baden Baden, wherever that is, and I would just piss myself <laughs> laughing. Um, can, one thing I do want to talk about is songwriting. Can we talk a little bit about that? Because you were hidden away and take that, then you finally go on your own journey and get to make your own songs. And your song of your career um, comes Angels. Massive, massive song, the biggest song. Someone claimed he wrote that. Mm. And there's a video on YouTube where this guy who explains exactly how, he, you sent us the video yourself, explains exactly how you're, and you, you're watching this guy and you're like, totally believe it. Like he's, he's so believable. Is it he's a conspiracy theory? To uh, it's not a conspiracy. Right. No, it actually happened. Mm. I'll t but I'll tell you the whole story after I've had a cigarette. All right. Okay. Wow. Okay. Yeah. After these, these messages. messages. Okay. It's, we've got a, an a, a list there now, so we can cut to a commercial break. The same as Loose Women. Yeah. He's going outside and going, yeah, honey, they yeah, slagged you off even to my face. Welcome back. Uh, next up, Robbie Williams tells us all about his uh, co-written song, Angels. <sighs> co-written song? Yeah. Yeah, because I left it on a bit of a cliffhanger there. But yeah. actually, because um, you said it was a conspiracy theory and I said it actually did happen. Yeah. Not that somebody co-wrote Angels with me. There's a guy in Ireland that um, I um, knew for a short period of time in between... Got better. Just so, Thanks, mate. Just helping you out, mate. In between um, Take That and my solo career. And uh, how Angels came about was I was in my sister's back garden and I thought that I should at least attempt to write a song. And uh, I knew that I could write lyrics because I'd done a bit in the past. So I sat down. I was like, right, I sit and wait. Does an angel contemplate my fate? Do they know the places where we go when we're grey and old? And, you know, it took me an hour to write a couple of verses. And my sister had a poem that she'd written. And one of the lines was, and as the feeling grows, she breathes flesh to my bones. And I'm like, right, I'm nicking that. So if anybody co-wrote the song, it was uh, my sister. Um, anyway. Did she see the royalties though? I think we all know the yeah, She's been well taken care of. Share the wealth, <laughs> you know, yeah. In, uh, in this period in time, I go out to Ireland and I go on the piss and I get very friendly with somebody very, very quickly. There's a whole extravaganza that goes on with this story. I might save it for the film one day, but I'll just be brief and keep it simple. And um, I'm back at his house and he's playing me this song that he's written and it's called Honey Pie, Don't Do It. 
it's about this girl that commits suicide. And I'm like, well, you, you, you write songs. We should write a song together. I've, I've got this idea for this song. And I hire a studio in Temple Bar in Dublin and we go into the studio. And we're such a mess because we're so mullered. We're just absolutely complete. I, in this time period while I'm in Ireland, one day I drank 23 pints of Guinness. I got up very early mm-hmm. and went all the way through the day. And after 23 pints of Guinness, I don't know if you've ever drank yourself sober. Everything just sort of wears... You think you're sober, but you're not really, but you, it feels like you are, doesn't it? It yeah. just wears off, doesn't well, it? I, I, I'd come out of the vortex mm-hmm. and was in a different place. Anyway, so we're in the studio. We can't quite get it together because I don't really know what I'm doing. We're drunk and it doesn't happen. But I've got this um, sort of song idea that I've got. And for Angels used to go in its first incarnation was uh, and as a vinegar uh, uh, I'm loving angels and angels and angels whoa angels instead and that was the chorus wow. bit of a crap chorus anyway so we're in the studio and we put something down and uh, I realised it's not working so we beat a hasty retreat and went to the pub and um, a few things went on with me and this guy while I was there and I left Ireland and um, my mum is in such a bad mood with me because I went to Ireland with her and then she never saw me because I was always in the pub and I was always with this guy. Mm. <clears throat> so she's furious because I'm, I'm in the middle of a, I'm worried about me because I'm in the middle of a heavy drinking problem. And uh, we are in Stoke-on-Trent one evening back at my mum's house and I um, need to go somewhere. My mum's driving me and I see this guy from Ireland. He's in Stoke and he's looking through the window of somebody's house and he's on his way to my house. And I said, Mom, that's, that's the guy. And we should go back to the house because he'll be at the house any minute now. And he, she said, well, he's not staying here because she was furious. He was the man that was sort of leading me astray, but I was, you know, we were leading each other astray. And there was a knock at the door and I opens it and I, I want to greet him and bring him in and at least give him the bed for the night but <coughs> I'm also in trouble with my mum so I said Raymond what what are you doing I thought you'd be pleased to see me and I'm like well <sighs> mate you can't stay here it's just weird that you're turning up out of the blue and I gave him a couple of hundred quid and said I think it was a couple of hundred quid and uh, go get yourself a bed and breakfast and go back to Ireland so he was downhearted and off he left I then go to I meet Guy Chambers who's my songwriting partner and the first day I said well I've got this idea for this song and I sing him the song and it's angels and then he hits a chord and I go and through it all she offers me protection and it sort of writes itself and we've got now the fully formed version of angels and I knew we got something really special and I, Guy got so ill the minute we'd finished writing it. There was like a, a download of something that happened and he took himself off to bed. And I just wandered the streets back from his house in uh, wherever it was and wandered sort of like uh, with this tape in my hand and I got in this cab and I went, mate, just play this. <coughs> and I put it on and he played Angels and he said, that's number one, that is. I knew we had something special. Anyway... I release my first album, and because this is this is like a myth that goes around. I, in fact, Bono uh, used to tell this story. I because like I, I was with Bono and he told me about this story that mm. you nicked this song from this busker, and um, I'm like that didn't happen. Why is Bono telling that? Because he'd heard it. He'd mm. heard folklore about this Irish busker that I'd happened to bump into and stole the song from. Did he not think from. about checking his facts before he started well, spouting we, his mouth you, Listen. Bono. Charity. If Charity. it's, if it's, if it's Charity. a good story, you know, I'll yeah. tell it. You know, If I, it's in favour of an Irish busker, I'm sure he'll tell it. I, I'm the same. If I hear a good story and it's just you've got to tell somebody, you've got to tell somebody. It doesn't happen to be true. Mm. Anyway, so uh, the album gets released and then I get a letter from a lawyer in Ireland. And uh, my client, Mr. Raymond Heffron, has uh, not only wrote All Before I Die, I think he said, and he's also written wow. uh, uh, oh, uh, Angels, but he's also written All Before I Die. Two great songs. Would, well, thank you very much. Yeah. Funny so, you picked the 
best two songs yeah. on the album. Well, it's funny, the yeah. two which, two which really sing is not too yeah. bad. <laughs> yeah. but he, he didn't claim that one. Anyway, so uh, I wrote All oh, Before I Die in Miami um, with, uh, yeah, with, a, with a Latino guy. I can't remember his name. What's his name, Chris? Desmond Childs. Desmond Childs, songwriter. He wrote Living on a Prayer. Oh, wow. Right yeah, yeah. Incredibly talented. So uh, this was the what we were left with. You mean that wasn't Bon Jovi? Uh, bon Jovi also had a hand what in a Living on bon a Prayer. Bon Jovi sang what a fucking it. Yeah. Anyway, so um, this, is, this is what was going to happen. It was all down to, it was he said, she said, or he said, he said. Now, we could have gone to court... And it would have all been down to whether, what 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 way the judge wakes up that day out mm. of bed and goes, I believe this guy and he's going to get the publishing, you know. So we were then left with like a settling out of court sort of thing because we couldn't have that happen, yeah. you know, because who, who believes who? Um, so I gave him some money and he went away. Uh, but in subsequent documentaries about me, he plays this tape that he's got with me singing. He never gets the chorus because there's no chorus. But he also said that um, what happened was his, him and his missus uh, were, she was pregnant and then she lost the baby. Right. And uh, when it's stillborn, uh, there's a term for it in Ireland you lose an angel. And he says this in a documentary. I've seen that. Yeah. And so he, believable. And he sits down and he said, and so I, I wrote the lyrics to angels underneath this statue in yeah. France. And I'm like, wow, that's oh, so I watched that back and I'm like, well, who's not going to believe that? Uh, He's got the sub story and everything. Yeah, and also, you know, it's incredibly believable. Mm. But um, look at the career he's had afterwards, though. He's gone yeah. on to hit, hit after hit after hit. No, so but here's the believe thing. him then. Here's the thing, and I'm like, I was telling this story to somebody in the past, and I was like, and he's a songwriter now, and yeah. he writes songs, and they're not going to be very good. And I press play, and it's like, that's it. Oh, it's actually a nice song. So that's a good song. Yeah. <laughs> is he actually a good songwriter? Yeah, he's a good songwriter. Is he? Yeah, he is. He's talented. Yeah. Uh, but the thing is, you know, it's like. On the Wikipedia page, it says, like, co-written by Raymond Heffron. And if you ever remove his name, somebody puts it back up straight away. So there's this myth going around that uh, Angels... Does that not piss you off? Yeah, it pisses me off. Yeah, it pisses me off. Um, and uh, ironically, your sister's probably not in the credits. And my sister's not in the credits <laughs> either, is. but she got looked after. Yeah. But it, it's unjust and it's unfair and it's my biggest oh. song. And, you know... I'm, I'm also became the corporate entity that is Robbie Williams. Mm. And of course, this person rode roughshod over somebody's career and stole this song. And it absolutely didn't How happen. How does it feel when people are always trying to take credit for all the things you've achieved? It doesn't happen very often. I've seen your manager stuck his little beak in and the take that manager. I was like, I gave him a, I made him. He was, he was basically, when you were saying, you know, I was good and that's why you picked me and he was putting off as, if I'd never picked you, you wouldn't be where you are today and stuff like that. So there, there are people out there who do that, surely. Yeah, but nothing that's raised its head in yeah. over 20-something years. So mm. it's it's not something that I could pass judgment on. Yeah. I'm normally taking credit for everybody else's work. Is the uh, songwriting process normally quite, e uh, not easy for you, but do you find it something that's quite natural? Um, not anymore. I found it really, right. you know, there was a lot to write about in the early days. My diary was interesting and, you know... That's why there's like the yeah. Oasis albums, the first two, are the most amazing. Because, because it's all the shit and pain that they've been through. All the shit and the pain and the high octane and the dreams and the naivety. And, and the Beatles. And the Beatles. And you kind of have a lot to write about. And then you... you even like writers like Eminem, you, you see the fire dims as they get older. Yeah, but it doesn't with him, does it? Well, sometimes Not, he comes back with something really, really no, good. But I think after... Um, was it recovery where yeah. we did uh, quite a few bangers on that one? But I just wanted to. I just wanted to get. I was like, oh, I can do this. Mm -hmm. I can sing melodies and I can write lyrics. Okay, I just wanted to get better and better and better. And I was never happy with what I'd just done. Mm -hmm. And I always thought that there was. I was working towards the. What's it called? The opus. Yeah. yeah. The the the, well, the 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 main body of work that would become your opus. What's the word yeah. for it? The opus deus or something. Like right. Where you're basically magnus. chasing after opus magnus, yeah. and you're basically chasing that. Yeah. Anyway, it didn't happen. 
So uh, <laughs> really, yeah. Well, you know, it's like I, I wrote some. I wrote some great well, songs. Well, your greatest hits is pretty fucking good. Like. Well, thank you very much. And it's what's your favorite the- Robbie Williams album? Um, the greatest hits. Yeah. The greatest hits. I'd yeah. go with the Beatles' greatest I'd hits. I'd say the best of the Beatles. The best. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Who, what, what, what is that even off again? Is that The Office? That's No, that's Alan Partridge, Alan Partridge. where he doesn't know anything about the Beatles, yeah. and then he goes, what's your favourite album? <laughs> Abbey Road. Well, I'd say the best of the Beatles. Anyway, so I've done 12 albums, and... Uh, do you my, still get the enjoyment out of making them? Not as much. Yeah. Not as much anymore. I, I find that, you know, when your career's rolling, mm-hmm. and you're at the zeitgeist... And everything's going your way. It's like playing a game of pool and you can't miss the ball. And then the oxygen that you need for that to survive erodes as time mm-hmm. goes on because, you know, pop is a young person's thing and it moves away and it moves on. And the oxygen that you need is saturation from radio. And then when radio decides to not play you, you because there's like loads of songs that I've had that if it was anybody else in any other band that kind of it wouldn't have it wouldn't have been hit wouldn't have been played but I was just in the pocket you know and Mm. then the oxygen is removed and you're not saturated Mm. anymore and you kind of like well I've got a family and I've got kids and also I've got an ego and I don't want to be yesterday's man and I want to keep this moving you sort of your priorities change and whereas before I was trying anything because I was experimenting all of a sudden you sort of like I've got to find a hit from somewhere and I never thought like that you know it's like I never thought the if I don't get a hit we all die and that's how it feels now it's like well if I don't get a bona fide hit it's the radio's not going to play me this is not going to work so but then you've you've gone into a territory that is different now because it's like I mean you're not you're not there yet but there are some artists who it doesn't matter how old they are and what they look like and anything like that, they're always going to be people who want to see that. Tom Jones, for example, is like just timeless. People will always turn up to watch him. And and you can you could easily be that guy. Yeah, but I, yeah, people do come. Pe- I've got a live audience. Of course. And they're, they're hopefully, if I do a good enough job every time I go on stage, they're going to stay with me. Mm-hmm. And um, I did a good job this summer. You know, I did a really good job. Um, so that's sort of taken care of but you want the game to go on as long as you can yeah. Yeah. you know you want to you want you don't want to you not, don't want to take part you want to be well, you the, sort as of, big as you can how joyous it feels to have written a song that then a stadium full of people yeah. know all of the words to and that happens year in year out year in year out and then so, then all of a sudden you release a song and then Oh, just a pocket full of people over there in a big stadium. It's, uh, Twenty-five. <laughs> is that hours. sometimes with the newer songs? Like, yeah, they don't know them as well. Yeah. yeah. So with the last album, was, I wrote eighty songs uh-huh. trying to find this gold nugget. It uh, there's a song called "I Love My is Life." Is that a mistake though? Yeah, it's a mistake. Because they they come to you, you don't. Well, you it's, a, it's if, a mistake. If you could generate a hit that easily, they'd well, be or something. They just turn in every single one. Out. Well, yeah, well, you know, it, it was a mistake. So I should write what I feel and how I feel. Right. But you just want the game to go on as long as you can, because there's um, there's a lot of fun doing promo. Podcast is a bit like that in a way. I mean, obviously, it's you're just chasing that next big. Guest, or the, the, you know, I go always, back to what I say earlier on. You're always I mean? going to be, you're always going to be chasing, them. raising the bar all the time. But but I seem to be moving into a different category of right, yeah. artist now. Mm. And uh, the the worst thing that can happen to me, I mean, my last album is a platinum album, mm-hmm. which is a massive album. It's mm-hmm. it's incredible. Um, but I didn't get the one hit, two hit, three hits, and off you go. It just it didn't happen. Yeah. I love my life. Kind of ha- made an impact. That was a big song, wasn't it? Yeah. Okay, so yeah. you know, you know, love my life. Of course, I oh, okay. So that made an impact. So maybe yeah. it does still exist. But I was always thinking that you know, when your audience moves away from you, or when people move on, it would feel deathly. But it's it's. All right, you know, I still got out to promote. I still got out to sing to 1.2 million people this summer. I've got a really incredible career. Yeah. It's just going in a different way, and I've just got to play my cards right now, you know, to keep people interested and to interest myself. Do you the next yourself? album I want to write, I, I just want to write a, a rock and roll album. Do you um, do you have a favorite Robbie Williams era? Like, do you have a favorite era version for of yourself? You. Your favorite version? 19, there were a lot of versions. 1978. <laughs> I was pure great. four year old yeah what a wonderful person uh, no not really I'm always writing the next thing 
Right. I'm always writing the next thing, always searching for the next thing. Whatever thought, I've got next, I'm the most passionate yeah. about. What's done is done, it's gone. How do you think that is to live with? Because that's a similar question to what we asked um, Eddie Hall's wife, uh, Eddie Hall about his wife. Um, how difficult that was to live alongside. How do you think you are to live with in when you're going through that creative process? Not difficult at all. I just go really? into the studio yeah. and I either come up with one or I don't come up with one. It's not like Eddie Hall like where, it, where it's... Generally a, though. Living with me generally? Yeah. Generally. You'd have to ask my wife. But there was one clip of you and I've got to admit this, right? It was when your missus was about to give birth and I, and I seen that clip of yeah. you. Yeah, where she's dancing. I thought to myself, what a fucking prick. <laughs> Yeah, but, yeah, but, What's he doing? Yeah, but He's he, dancing around, she's in labour, just like... But did you see all the other ones? But, oh, I, I gathered it was a joke afterwards, but yeah. when I first watched it, I thought, I was, what the fuck's Robbie Williams doing these days? I, I was absolutely mortified, because we arrived at the um, the hospital, and Ida had bought some really flashy heels that she was going to be in bed with and she was going to Instagram the picture which she did uh-huh. and it was like oh look everybody's looking at the picture of the heels that's funny uh-huh. we should do a thing we should do a thing we, we did a sketch so then we did a sketch Got where write a sketch. Ida is up and she's dancing in front of me and she's really pregnant uh-huh. and it looks funny and we're like oh look everybody's looking at that it's funny do you know what we should do next and then it escalated because it escalated. made you look like a twat and, yeah, it did. and so then people start retweeting that one yeah a, a lot more so, no, so the we, context has gone we think we're in a hospital in Los Angeles and we <coughs> think everybody's getting the joke and everybody's playing along no, with not us not the first time no no not at all mm. so and we're like and you know what I should do now I should dance around you <laughs> and you should be really unimpressed and so we do this whole thing and then Charlie's born and we have we have a laugh and the, the, the birth of Charlie mm-hmm. we just had a laugh all night making up these sketches and being silly and then we didn't think anything about it and then uh, the next day sort of open up the room where she's just given birth and the lady comes out of the next room and she said oh I just oh I just saw you on um, Good Morning America and we're like what? you saw us on what because I'm not famous in America and I was like yeah we saw you oh my god the thing that your husband was doing and I was like there's a it's not gone it's not gone down very well yeah people think that I'm that guy Northeast viral 47 million people Jesus via Facebook yeah. YouTube that was the impression that I got as well yeah I know yeah. and I mean like uh, I quite like I don't know how you, I don't know how you spoke because we're going to do more of that stuff in the future and there will be more clangers drop yeah. but I, 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 I don't know how you signal to people that are, actually she's in on the joke this is a joke well, I watched it back. Hashtag I watch ad it. at the bottom, hashtag well, yeah, joke. Because now I know you a lot better. I watched uh-huh. it back uh, on the way down today and I was like, oh, that's obviously a joke. But the first but the time, time I watched it, I didn't no, get but, it. But I, but, but I wonder because I wonder if you are told what to think because of the headline in the newspaper. Yeah, totally. Which is, which is what, you Probably. know, is like the signal is yeah. look at Robbie Williams being an absolute dick to his wife because it went down like a shit sandwich. Yeah. You know, it's like there was a lot of joy and then yeah. all of a sudden... I Loose was, women would have been right out for you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, Again. Uh, Colin Nolan was yeah. like f- finger wagging yeah. and she was just like, uh, how could you do that? And I'm like, how could you not see that it was a gag? Yeah. But I do think the way people uh, type it up in the newspapers and online is like it influences what you think totally. before you watch it. Most people won't even watch the video. They'll just sort of go, oh, he was, was doing that. Move on. Yeah, yeah. Dick. I'd yeah. never liked him anyway, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, because there, like, there was like a, a, we used to go to like Mums Inc. or something online to look up things. It's like Monsters take, Inc. Yeah, to, 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 to how do you take care of your babies and stuff. And then there'd be like forums for Robbie Williams. What a nasty bastard he was. I'm like, heartless. Oh, oh my God, heartless. Were you yeah. setting up uh, anonymous accounts and going, I don't know, I quite like this here. Yeah. <laughs> What a, yeah, millennium. Yeah, this is but some good you, birthing music. Yeah. yeah. I don't know if you've listened to Better Man. Have a listen to the lyrics of Better Man. good. That's the real Robbie Williams. That yeah. guy in the, anyway, listen. My favourite era. Uh, I like the one you did all the rap pack stuff and that. It was uh, a good one. I really like that. Which is a very good moment to actually bring in the man that influenced me uh, into loving that good. era. Yeah, the yeah. yeah. That, was a, that was a seamless segue. Yeah, That's really good. Pretty good. Dad? Hello. My favourite Robbie era was probably when you started to do the swing stuff and Sinatra and uh, to be honest I was a little bit like Robbie doing that and then but when you did the show 
we had a moment where I was rounded a family friend's um, house where uh, me and she goes um, <clears throat> did you get a Robbie Williams DVD for Christmas? <laughs> and then she, she asked about six people in the room and she like she went, you have not had a Christmas unless wow. you have this. That was, wow. she said, this is Christmas. Wow. Shout out to Sylvia. If she's, um, if Shout she, out to Sylvia. Sylvia. Wow. Um, she pirated your DVD six <laughs> no, times in order to hand it out. Yes. No, she, yeah, she, she absolutely loved you and, um, and uh, she absolutely loved that DVD. And uh, one of her favourite bits, I think, was um, where you said uh, to your mum, you were like, oh. This is your mum sing yeah. yeah. singing on stage. Yeah. yeah was that was a big moment for us in the room. Oh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that bit of show business hit. No, we loved it. This is the man that's responsible for my love for that kind nice of music. Nice to be here, yeah. Yes. Th those were the days, weren't they? That's Mr. Like, Williams. You grew up with listening to that sort of music, mm -hmm. which is my kind of music, still is. Mm -hmm. And I'm a big fan then, I'm still a big fan now, and I just love it. What's your favourite um, Robbie song from This is from my dad, that? by the way. Yeah, yeah. yeah, by the way. Sorry, we've been talking tell. for a while. <laughs> this is Mr. Williams himself. This is Mr. Williams Sr. Yeah. Mr. Williams Jr. You can actually take credit for Robbie in a lot of well, ways. Well, in a lot of Did ways. Did you write Angels? Yeah. So I was he wrote there. Angels. He wrote Angels, wow. I, I was there at the conception. <laughs> <laughs> as far as we yeah. know this is part of the job so it? what's your favourite um, song that Robbie does from that era oh uh, Mr Bojangles really yeah, yeah that's that's, uh, because I remember him saying to me he was a bit concerned whether, whether he'd get it right or wrong because it's a great song it is and it was done by Sammy Davis mm -hmm. that was Sammy did, Sammy did a great job on it mm -hmm. I remember Rob saying to me I don't know whether I'll do it justice or not well, he didn't just do it justice, he knocked it really oh, out, yeah. the, out the ballpark and it was great. And I got a big kick out yeah. of it. Yeah, because you were doing cool music then and then all, out of nowhere you go and do this sort of stuff. And I was a little bit like, yeah. I'm not sure this is the right move. For well, but I, you pulled it off. What I liked about it is there's not many people that do what Rob does that could actually move over. And, and I think he set a precedent there mm. because he did that swing album. A lot of other people did swing albums yeah. thereafter and that came and it started with Rob's and it's a it high selling album, I think. Is it? Yeah, eight million copies. Yeah, yeah. really. Yeah, yeah. It did really Jesus. well. Terry yeah, Venables I, did one. But I did the Amateur Operatic Society stuff, so uh -huh. I'm, I'm very much well jazzed. Well versed, yeah. Do you think my, that came from a... Oh, yeah. My, I was yeah. watching my dad yeah, in I'm, 1974. Yeah. One is Heat on... I won New Faces in 73. I did the Winter Show in 74. Was that the, the biggest was, talent I, show then? I, I, yeah, it was then. I was yeah. doing comedy then. I was doing stand-up comedy. But I used to do a song to get off. So and, and I, I did that for forever. That's how I earn my living. And then one night in 1999, I sang "That's Life" with Rob on the BBC. It's, it, what, one night with Robbie Williams, I think it was called. And um, I did this song, this "That's That's Life," and suddenly became a singer. In 1999, mm -hmm. I was doing the holiday camps at that time. But uh, then I was getting phone calls from television shows. We'll put a big band in and come sing something with us. And I thought, well, why wow. not? I like the sound of this. So as much as I wanted to be like Chuck D and Easy E, I also <laughs> wanted to be Morecambe and Wise, Tommy Cooper, yeah. Danny Kaye, uh, Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin. So I, 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 I was allowed to play with my heroes. And I went to record uh, Swing When You Went In at the Capitol Studios in Los Angeles yeah, where Sinatra there. recorded all of his records. And I played with Sinatra's uh, piano player uh, on wow. One For My Baby. Bill, yeah. yeah. And you did the duet with Dean Martin. Did the duet with Dean Martin too. That was another Pos one. Posthum uh, posthumously. Oh, it was absolutely wonderful. You can't imagine for me going with my lad into the, Cap the Capitol Studios where I've seen it on the telly, I've seen Sinatra there. The Beatles recorded there, mm. Nat King Cole, all my people. But, uh, and now your son's there. And now my lad's there, yeah, wow. how good. It, was that a bit surreal? Oh, it's brilliant. Yeah. I've had such a big kick. I mean, I've had an extension of my uh, entertaining life because I, I've, I've done okay. I mean, I've survived for a long time. But yeah. Big Conway was the stage name, mm -hmm. still is, when I work. But mm -hmm. um, I, I've just become, I've been, from being Pete Conway. Dad comes on tour with me. He I've comes seen out and does yeah. a song. I've seen him on your vlogs as well. Yeah, yeah. I've become Robbie Williams' his dad. Yeah. That's my title now. I used to be Pete Conway. I'm Robbie Williams. But you used dad. to be his, like, known as his son because he was Pete, the, Pete Conway's he son. Was the yeah. name back in Stoke. I'll tell you a story right from the beginning when Rob was very young and I was doing okay and I was on the telly and doing radio. And Rob was at school and I was divorced from Jan. 
and then people get, used to say to Robert School, you can't be Pete Conway, son, because your name's Williams. <laughs> yeah. So he had to fight his corner. Then later, when Rob got in to take that, girls were saying to me, you can't be Robbie Williams, Dad, because your name's Pete Conway. <laughs> so it happened to tell me. Him the, tell him the story about the time that you were abroad and that woman came up to you and asked you what uh, Robbie Williams is. Oh, we, we were, we've been playing golf. I was with my mates. We were sitting at the end of a bar here. So here's the bar. Here's the latest toilets here. And I'm sitting on here having tapas. And there's only a few people, and it's early. We were at a game of golf. And this woman walked past and went into the loo. When she came out, she came to me and she said, aren't you Robbie Williams' dad? I said, I am, yeah. She said, I thought you were. She said, oh, I think you So we went through all the questions and answers. She said, I've got a friend over there. And she said, and they were the daughter and they're big fans. Do you mind if they come over? I said, no, no, don't bring them over. So we carry on having the tapas. And she comes over to me with a friend and the daughter. And the friend said, um, if you were Robbie Williams' dad, who's his favorite singer? I said, that's a good one. I said, it's a quiz. The quiz we got. I said, right. I have no idea. I said, I think it all depends on who he wakes up thinking about in the morning, basically. She said, you're not Robbie Williams' dad. I said, no, no. She said, no. She said, totally his, his favourite singer is Elvis Presley. I said, oh, is it? She said, he's got Elvis tattooed on his arm. Come away, he's a dickhead. <laughs> and dragged this little daughter off. <laughs> Come away, he's a dickhead. Come away, he's a dickhead. So she looks at me like oh, that. I went... And so my mate said, you just call your dick out. I said, I don't care. So, I mean, I, I, I'm just sitting here. I'm Still Robbie Williams' his dad. Yeah, so, and then when she was going out, <laughs> she looked at me and she went, <laughs> and went. So he, he is. Is it, is it Elvis? True. Is it Elvis? What, I'm out. Yeah, he's got yeah. Elvis. I've got uh, Elvis Grammy Serenity. I'm, right. I'm, I'm, I'm quite a big Elvis fan as well, to be honest with Elvis you. Elvis is good. I think he's really under, especially by... Young men these days. I don't think people realise how good Elvis was. Let me tell you a little story about what we did. We went on the on the tour to Australia, and th this is the tour. This is the story of the tour when we did the swing tour in mm -hmm. Australia. I left my camera on the plane, so we, we arrive in Perth, first day in Australia, and I go into a little shop in Perth, run by little Chinese ladies, and I said, I need a new camera, that one there. She said, You need memory stick and battery. I said, okay. I said, well, you put them in for me because I'm hopeless. She said, I put for you. So she puts them in. She says, you here holiday? I said, a bit holiday, a bit work. She said, what you do? I said, I sing. She said, say, what song do what song you sing? I said, I sing swingy things. She said, I like swingy things. I said, oh, do you? She said, where <laughs> you go do that? I said, the arena. She said, you go sing arena? I said, yeah. I said, you know Robbie Williams? She said, Lobby, Lobby come Perth. I said, Lobby came with me last night. I'm his dad. She said, no, you're Lobby dad. No, girls, all these girls, 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 clubby dad. No, really. You have photo with girls. Yes, of course. What? All these photos. Then she says, you want kiss? I thought that's rather nice. So and she said, no, no, no. Kiss for camera, camera case. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going, <laughs> and she's going, what do you do? Oh, it wasn't that cleaner again, was it? <laughs> nearly got done for assault. Uh, nearly got done for, uh, <laughs> I've only been there five minutes, nearly got done for sexual assault. So I, I was very pleased to get out of there. I just Scandal in the papers. Got a laugh when I got back and told yeah. the lads when I got in the hotel anyway. Yeah. Unreal. Yeah. It's good to see how close you are. I, I, Dad's we, always with us. We have a lot of laughs on stage. It, yeah, it's, I've um, seen that. It's, it's great, it's wonderful. Well, there, there, was, there was one great opening when, you, uh, when I came on on one of the shows this time, when you had done a few <laughs> songs... And we, I think we were in Norway somewhere. We were up in Scandinavia somewhere. And because he just does one, one line of the song and everybody sings. So they all go off and it's like a big karaoke session. It? They all know the words. So he's done three or four songs and they haven't been singing with him. And he's had to graft to get him going. So <laughs> I come on, he's in here, here's my dad. So I walk on, ta-da. And he said, they don't know why I'm so your fault. <laughs> <laughs> There's that one night when I'm on stage with you and just had this very touching moment where um, me and my dad are holding hands together and the audience are uh, they're really wrapped up in the whole sentiment yeah. of what's happening on stage. And, and I turn to my dad and oh. I just whisper something to him and he nods back at me and everybody's wondering what it was. Oh, it was yeah. on the boards, it was on the comments of Twitter. I wonder what he said, said to, to his, his dad. dad. And what I said was... Match of the day as soon as we get it. <laughs> <laughs> and I, thought, I love that. And it's, 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 I've actually seen it on, it's on somebody recording it. And if you can lip read, you can see it. Match of the day. <laughs> and, and then we all, then we all. Yeah. Like that. And, 
The most have thought, oh, what a great night and how wonderful it's been tonight. Match mm-hmm. today as soon as we get in. Brilliant. And did you watch Match of the Day as soon as Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. oh, yes, we, we did. Uh, with match of the Day is on. That's where we are. We'll be watching it. We'll watch it. Wait, it won't be Match of the Day. We're watching football tonight. Yeah. yeah. Nice. That's what Shall we, we wrap do. wrap up? Yeah, mate. Um, you got... What's no, I'm really, I'm really satisfied with yeah. what we got. Congratulations. Thanks very much. I passed. Yeah, yeah. 100%. Good. Yeah. I had a, um, no D. I had a weird moment, by the way, when we were um, going to do this podcast, when I knew we were going to do the podcast, because um, a while, like about seven, eight years ago, someone that like really close to us like lost them, they died. And, you know, when you're going through like a really bad time or whatever, and music's on the radio and stuff like that, and it hits you a lot harder. And I'm w- wandering around my house, Fucking Angels comes on. And it's it's that song, isn't it, when you're really emotional? Yes. Next thing I know, I'm just sitting down on the floor fucking crying my eyes out, right? <laughs> anyway, I go to see a close friend of mine the next day. And I said, fucking last night, I just absolutely lost it. Absolutely. What happened? I went, bloody Angels was on the radio, wasn't it? Anyway, I went, that fucking Robbie Williams, honestly. <laughs> and um, obviously you got in touch via email and I went I went round I went you'll never guess who's asked me to be on my podcast <laughs> fucking Robbie Williams I'm going to tell him for what he did to us and um, when you emailed us you went you said in the, in the first email you said something or someone is telling me I need to come on your podcast and just the way you wrote that I went fucking hell and I told this person that story and they went Fucking shivers up my spine here. Yeah, you know? serendipitous. So, um, my last question, my last thing I want to say is thanks for getting us through that tough time because sometimes Pleasure. you just need to cry your fucking eyes out. Aye. And that song really helped Glad us. And um, how would you like to be remembered is my final thing I want to ah, say. You always say this, yeah. When did you come up with this idea that the, the last bit of the show was going to be? I just think we, that we were in Ireland with this guy and we were writing a <laughs> script and, and he just said. <laughs> um, it just gives you a real good idea of who a person is when you ask them who they want to be seen as. Do you get good answers though? Do you get what you're looking for? Um, sometimes. So, no, no. I, th- I think sometimes when you, I don't place any expectations on that. Some people like Alan Shearer kept it short and sweet, but it, he says it, it it really give you a good window into who he really is. Do you know what I mean? So I think that's all I'm trying to do with that question. No pressure. Yeah, I don't care. Really? Yeah, it's the answer because I'm Darby dead. <laughs> no, but it, it's not. It doesn't have to be. Well, do I lead with people? No, but it, it doesn't have to be about how general public sees you. It. it could be your family, your daughter, like any anything. You I, know what I mean? I want my kids to know that they are loved and they are safe and they always have been. I want to have been. I want to have done a great job there. Um, I want to be a good husband to my wife. Um, but that's about it. Mm-hmm. I what I, I don't care because people talk about oh yeah we're working with such and such and he's building these gyms and that's going to be his legacy and mm-hmm. he sees it as his legacy and there's a big legacy thing in America that people talk about yeah. and I'm like well well you not have that though. I'll be fucking dead no but like so for example your legacy in the eyes of the British public is the biggest selling male. Uh, solo artist in British music history that is a legacy whether you want it or not it's there yeah well I can't do anything about that one it's happened and I'm glad it's happened <laughs> to me uh, but what's yours I mean that'll be for another podcast mate but this is about you pal we'll get to that one that's at the end of the conspiracy right. podcast you can ask that question back alright we'll yeah, get the, you on another one the answer one. is I just want to be a good dad and I want to be a good husband and I want to be a good friend uh, what's yours dad I don't want to go <laughs> <laughs> We'll put That's that on his headstone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, That's mate. A good answer. Thanks very much. Absolute pleasure, pleasure, gentlemen. Good to see you. Both. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Thanks pleasure. for coming. Nice seeing Thank you. Thanks very for much. coming to your own house and letting us use it. Thanks, yeah. guys. Cheers. Which Thanks, one we're doing, the con? This one here. Straight All down right. the main barrel. Uh, hopefully you've enjoyed this. Uh, we'll, we'll hopefully try and get them on again. Let us know what you thought of it. It's been emotional. Like the video. Subscribe. Thanks for watching. We'll see you later. I'll see you in the comments section. <laughs>